action capital budget review for January 26th will come to order. So, uh, Brian, are you on or who's on? Who's going to be? Uh, so, I'll do I'll do the roll call and then it's uh, Michelle is going to host it. So, your uh, Michelle will be helping you guys out. I'm sorry, um, Barbara is waiting in the waiting room for some reason. I don't know what that means to me right now. Whoever is running the, the, the Zoom has to let her in. Does Diane need to be let in as well? Diana Carpio should be let in as, as well as Godfrey Azima. Thank you. I'm going to call the roll, Fran. Yeah, uh, before, did you prepare Michelle for these sessions, Brian? <laughs> No, I threw her in. Uh, she'll do good. Sink or swim. Okay, take the roll call. <laughs> All right, uh, Mr. Lesko. Here. Miss Peniston. Here. Mr. Baxendale. Here. Mr. Meglio. Here. Miss Shockley. Here. Uh, Mr. Mishak. Here. Mr. Ferguson. Here. Good evening. I think, and Miss Langallis. There you are. Here. That's everyone. Okay, we're going to go right into it. And um, human relations and fair rent wanted to go first because of other uh, conflicts. So who's on for that? I think Aye, that would good, be um, Anna Keegan with the Norwalk Human Relations and Fair Rent. I think Lamont Daniels wants to open, and then it'll be me and Darlene. Hello, good okay. evening again. Uh, just as a refresher, I don't see I don't uh, present before this group often. Uh, Lamont Daniels, Chief of Community Services. So Anna Keegan and Darlene Young will be presenting on our our capital budget. Again, thank you for allowing us to go as um, we do have. Um, a very important role that we have to attend to right after this meeting. So thank you again for letting us go first. So I'll turn it over to uh, Darlene Young. You're on mute. <laughs> <You're st> <laughs> you double clicked it, Darlene. <laughs> I know, Zoom world. Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> We can hear you, darling. Go All take right. it away. <laughs> so I just wanted to say thank you um, for this opportunity again to present before the um, commission. Um, so as you can see, for our ADA capital budget project, we are looking to do um, improvements at the Norwalk Senior Center to install accessible facility to accommodate patrons with mobility barriers. Um, and that specifically addresses, the, that facility would be on the main floor um, when you enter the senior center. Um, they wanna turn a closet or a small space into a, a, a ADA accessible um, facility. Um, and the cost for that project would be 80,000 as presented here. And, when she and we've says done, and, and, and in addition to that, I, I, because I know we've come before you with additional uh, bathroom projects um, at the library, I, I'm sorry, at the um, senior center um, a year or so ago, um, but that was for the two facilities that are on that second tier um, when you get up the stairs to, the, uh, to enter into the other portion of the building. Um, so we're looking to do this on the lower level. And when she says an ADA accessible facility, it's going to be both an accessible bathroom and also an accessible shower, which will allow right. um, seniors who have accidents to clean up before getting on the bus. And also it's important to have one on the first floor because it is such a long walk from the uh, bus stop to the facilities on the second floor. Very good. Any commissioners have any questions? Okay. Oh, that and is too easy. It's what? That's perfect. <laughs> you say it's too easy. We can make it That's difficult. It. I like that. I'm sorry. Could I, Fran, could I just ask one clarifying question? 
Uh, yeah. at, which, at which senior housing is this at? So it's at the Norwalk Senior Center on Allen Road. Thank you. Yes. That was easy, wasn't it? I Yeah, new year, right? It makes right. me worried something went wrong. Well, yeah, well, you can go there. I just have one quick question. The bathrooms are Steve, on the first floor, right? The bathroom work that was done two years ago. That's all mm -hmm. complete, that's all ADA already. That's ADA already, yeah. Yes, it's ADA already. Okay, good, okay. Those two bathrooms went through a complete overhaul, complete renovation. So they're totally new facilities on that second tier. All right. Hearing no other questions, uh, get out while you can. Thank so. you so much. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Thank you all Thank very you. much. Have Thank a nice night. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Michelle. Okay, next we have uh, the uh, police department and combined dispatch. We have uh, Chief uh, Kuhalik and Deputy Chief uh, Zeka. Hello, good evening, everybody. Hello, Chief. So what you see in, the, in our requests are, it's nothing new, it's items that have been requested previously. Uh, specifically, our replacement of the firing range, which we've asked for for several years now, which is in dire need. Uh, our normal cars and vans, our police vehicle purchase, and the uh, Faro 360 scanner, which is the uh, computerized system to recreate crime scenes and crash and collisions, which has been requested for several years now. And then going out to 2023 is the Marine unit uh, replacement of the Marine unit, 1.5 million. This is in combination with the uh, Recreation and Parks Department's upgrade as well uh, to coordinate a welcome center and new Marine unit. And that's also something that has been on the table here previously as well. So I don't know if exactly what questions you may have, but uh, Deputy Chief Zek is here and Mickey Dosimo, our budget person is here as well. Now this is uh, this is new for us for the cars, right, Chief? For the capital budget? No, last year was the first year that it was moved from operating to capital. Prior to that, it had always been operating. When the new CFO took over, uh, he he requested that we move the item to the capital budget, which we did last year. And with with that addition to the when we put it into the capital budget, we started projecting it out five years. Our, what our needs are for the five years of the capital budget. Now on the firing range, I know you requested it. And I, I think this group here uh, approved it. Um, what, like, what's the capacity right now? Is it a fifty percent, eighty percent, a hundred percent bad? Where, where are you? Well, the the capacity hasn't changed. We have this, the size. Everything is still the same. The issue is the guts of the range, the workings. The targets don't move as they should. Um, a lot of the mechanicals are broken and the, the company's out of business and has been for several years now. The range was installed when the building was built in 2005. Um, so it's long past its lifespan. And although it is usable, it is not where it should be, but we're making do with uh, duct tape and other things to get to keep it running. Chief, just as a matter of uh, interest, how often do your um, police fire a weapon during the course of the year in a legitimate situation? The, well, at a minimum, we do several trainings for the whole department, which is low light training and the regular qualifications. And then in addition to that, there's other specialized trainings that take place. The tactical team uses it for specialized trainings. Um, officers also use it on a regular basis just for competency training outside of uh, our mandated training. So it's, it's in use basically every day by someone or, or multiple people. But uh, at a minimum, we have the whole department go through two complete firearm training sessions. Thank you. Hey, uh, just a couple of things. Uh, you know, the the POCD number is wrong. So I, I want to call that out so that I, this happened last year as well. And I don't know 
Uh, Michelle, take please take a note. We talked about that last year, how it's not, uh, you know, going for, I don't know why it prints out. It's, it's definitely not a, a police POCD number. And then number two, you know, the, the range has been on for previous years and the scanner, but in our book here, it shows as a new project. So I believe, and I, I don't want to speak for finance, but I believe it's because the new system that was instituted to track the capital budget classified basically everything as new. Uh, that's my understanding anyway, but they're not new projects. No, I know. I mean, I'm saying you might want to argue that point with, with them if you, if you want, because you look at a new project versus a project that it's been on the books for a couple of years, you know, di different this, this is just a suggestion to you, D different way measures, you know, a brand new project versus one that's been requested, you know, previous years. It doesn't help you that it shows, you know, it's new when it's not brand new. And I think finance, and uh, I'll send a no out to uh, Angela and myself because these POCD numbers, whatever they're kicking out, you know, I don't know if you can see yours, uh, what it says, you know, it doesn't make any sense. You know, it talks about, uh, you know, the um, create a multifaceted strategy to support entrepreneurship. That's what it gives the police, right? So doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I'll defer to, to Mickey because I know he was working on that and we've, we've been working with the finance department. I, my understanding was they were going to create a new code that better yeah. reflected public safety, but I don't know where that stood. Yeah, I went through the codes as recently as today. Uh, in the past, there was a limited number of codes. They were supposed to create ones that we could use. I saw one new code, which we changed on the intranet, but there's nothing that really fits these projects. There was one code that's going to fit the Marine unit relocation for next year, but there are no codes that fit. I spoke to Angela today. She said they were on the internet. I had a call into Steve Kleppen. But there's really um, I can give you right now there's no codes. I can give you some help on that. If you, if you look okay. at the ADA regarding safety, safety That's for right. pedestrian, safety for the public health, that might be an, uh, a way to get that subcode in there. If you want to just highlight safety and uh, free movement of, of pedestrians, that might help uh, with those. Just a thought. But um, OK, Fran, if you mind, I had, I had a question for the chief. Fran, is that OK? Hey, just one more second. But uh, on the okay. code thing. You, did you agree that this the, the, this code is it should be in the book? Uh, there was I, I didn't agree or disagree. This was a code that we put in. This was the only code available when we put in this project that was whatever a couple of years ago. And w myself and the chief and I believe Deputy Chief Zeka has questioned and they were supposed to add new codes. But like I said, as of today, I didn't see anything that would fit this project. So I'll continue to to work with them. I'm going to say the last year I pointed out it was wrong when a new book for the new POCD came out. So whatever they're doing, whatever it is, it's not, it's not working. So I'm going to send a note out to Angela myself. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Steve. Thank you. Yeah. Steve. Uh, just real quick, Chief. Um, the past notes I have for the last two years, we were looking at electronic vehicles. I don't see that in this year. Is it something that you guys are um, pushing back on that you guys don't need? Because um, we were... We, we put together some electronic uh, electronic vehicles or electric vehicles, rather electric. I'm sorry, not gas powered. Oh, that I think you're hybrid. probably hybrid. Yes. Yeah. These are yeah. hybrid vehicles. OK, um, th th it doesn't mention that here. So if, uh, it just doesn't mention that in these write ups. So it does. Um, it okay. does? I, we, we could. I don't it does. Know. So we've still been uh, researching whether um, the, the hybrids as they were were new last year. The plan is to go to hybrid. And so far we have not, talking to other police departments, they have not had issues with them. So our plan was to go to the hybrid vehicle. I'm sorry, someone said that it is highlighted here. I'm sorry, I probably don't have the same copy that you're looking at, I apologize. I don't think it's in there. Okay. No, I don't believe it's in there. Okay. Uh, Fran? Fran? Yep, go ahead. Oh, who, uh, who just said something? Was that you, Mary? Tammy, I think it was Tammy. Oh, Tammy, go ahead. Thank you, Mike. Um, hi, good evening, everybody. Um, two things, 
in the public works, they use code 111B, which is to uh, continue to update, modernize, and maintain Norwalk's infrastructure and city facilities. So at, at a minimum, I think that would be a decent code for you. But I don't want to get hung up on the codes. I'm more interested in what you guys are interested in, in doing for the police department. Um, can you tell me now, do we have two K-9 vehicles? Is that the standard for the city we need two? As opposed to one or three? No, oh, we have Pardon? more than two, but we have two that are very old that are due to be replaced. We mm -hmm. actually have, what do we have, four, I believe? Four, four. or five? Four. We currently have four, and um, but two are really kind of on their last legs. They need to be replaced. Um, those vehicles are... They transport the dog back and forth to work as well as on their shifts. So, um, oh, they're, they're used for police dogs as opposed to picking up stray dogs or problematic dogs. Those canine yeah. vehicles are yes, they're they're assigned to the officer who has a canine. Oh, okay. Uh, a, I thought it was partner. a paddy wagon for the dog. No, no. Okay. Um, all right. My it's a marked husband. police car that also has the dog in it. So th it needs specialized equipment within. Okay, thank you. May I just ask what, what you define as last legs? I'm sorry? May I ask what you how your definition of what last legs a vehicle is on its last legs? And not the dogs, of course, the vehicle. <laughs> uh, if you saw the, the canine vehicle for Officer Peterson, you would it'd be pretty apparent. He's still driving a, a, a Crown Victoria, which is I don't know what year it even is. Um, Old. They haven't been made for a number of years. He's well over, probably one hundred fifty thousand miles on, on that vehicle. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Fran. Are we reviewing each page here, or can I continue on with my questions, uh, like in the whole police thing? No, continue. No, okay, thank you. Um, all right. So then, my next um, question is, please. The uh, Marine Unit Housing, where is this building and what does it house? And is that your um, estimate there also including oh, yeah. some type of ve a boat or something or is it just a structure? No, this would be just a structure. Uh, the location has not been finalized. There's a site plan that's being done to verify that. Our hope is that it would be at Vets Park where the current uh, Welcome Center is. The Recreation and Parks Department has money in the capital budget to redo and upgrade the Welcome Center. This plan would merge our capital budget money with theirs and create a Welcome Center, new Marine base uh, with all, you know, obviously facilities for boaters, et cetera, there as well. Um, it is only for constructing a new Marine unit. Right now we're across the river uh, by Sono Seafood in a rental building that's on it, you know, I don't want to say last legs, but it gets flooded. Um, it, it's been tough to even keep that thing running. So um, that is the plan going forward. So it would be a combination of both police use and public use in the same structure? Correct. Okay. Separated, but correct. Okay, thank you. Um, and then um, you haven't talked about it yet, but the scanner, um, did we have this? This was on your budget before. I think you, you mentioned that, but I'm, do you remember how many years this has been on your budget request list? I believe four or five, okay. I, at least four, but I believe maybe even five. It's been a while. Okay, thank you. Um, that's it for me, thank you. Okay, Mike. Ushak. Tamara had her uh, uh, raised hand symbol up before me. Thank I'm gonna you. do that now too. It's use that. So go ahead, Tamara. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, I'm noticing there's no request for body cameras. And I see that in June, you had talked about assigning police officers, police officers to research body camera companies. What happened uh, to this research? And why aren't body cameras on the request? I'm not sure what you're referring to with June. We've had body cameras issued now to all officers for uh, about a year and a half now. Um, I don't know what the June date was. That might've been dash cameras, I'm guessing, but I'm not familiar with what the June- Tam Tamara, Tamara, what are, what are you reading from? 
I'm looking at an article from the Norwalk Reflector, and it states that Norwalk Police Department is looking at uh, to research three body camera companies to find out which is best. Norwalk, Reflector, Norwalk that's Reflectors. Ohio? That's in Ohio. Yeah, that's oh, I get sorry. I get sorry. I get Google alerts for them all the time. Yeah, that's okay. in Ohio. <laughs> but are you looking at body cameras? I think body cameras are very important. Are you looking at body cameras? Are all no, the we, we just replaced. Them? We just replaced them all. Everyone has one and they're all brand new about a year ago. Okay. Uh, let me caution everybody to keep to the data that we have in our packets, okay? And I and I mentioned it before, you know, it's easy to go on the computer and search while we're doing these meetings, but that's outside of the public realm. So, uh, you know, the public is um, has, is, has access to all our information. So if you're going somewhere else to get info and stuff, either you got to make it part of the public record and send it in to planning and zoning and talk about where you're getting the data from or whatever you're, you know, you're, you're reading from or whatever, or because um, we just, you can't do independent, uh, we can't do independent uh, research without putting it into the public record. Okay. All right. Who's uh, next? with the raise hand. Me. Go ahead. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you, Fran, uh, for reminding me of that. So uh, I am going to take your advice and put something into the record. Uh, hello, Chief and Deputy Chief. And um, the, I did, uh, I mean, I'm watching the news and the uh, president has just announced yesterday that the entire government fleet, it's almost a million vehicles are gonna be electric uh, within a couple of years. They do cost more initially, uh, they'll be hybrid or electric. But um, uh, I also did some research, which I'm putting into the record now. Wilton uh, uh, bought, I think an Explorer or a couple of Explorers last year. You probably know this already, but the, the, they're hybrid. And Westport also bought a, uh, bought a, uh, purchased a hybrid vehicle. And, uh, and so the research I did, which I'm putting into the record now, is that you know, initially a couple of years ago, we were concerned about maintenance because they were going to be different than the other vehicles, right? And the mechanics are used to the internal combustion. But it turns out a, a lot of police departments, of course, are the bigger ones, New York and LA and bigger cities, have been doing that for you know probably about 10 years. But uh, now Connecticut, a lot of towns are switching to hybrid. So all I'm, uh, and they're, uh, you save on fuel and maintenance, and then the batteries have to be replaced after, uh, you can get a warranty for 10 years. They generally last like 10 years, because that's an argument that's made is that you have to replace these expensive batteries. And I'm just putting all this into the record to say I applaud the fact that these are hybrid. I also didn't know these would be hybrid and I didn't see that it, it wasn't mentioned. Uh, so that's really exciting news. Um, and the other thing I found out about police vehicles, which I'm putting in the record now, um, is that uh, generally police uh, patrol cars, in, I think on average, they idle about 40% of the time. I don't know where ours are, but they're probably a third or 30 or 40% of the time. And idling is a big, uh, uh, wears out internal combustion engines. But when you have a hybrid, you can do all of your electrical systems uh, on, on the battery while they're sitting there, you know, which they need to have the radios on and everything. And that actually saves a lot of fuel and a lot of wear and tear on the engines. So in the long run, it's like the hybrid really makes a lot of sense for police vehicles because most other vehicles don't idle for as uh, you know, for that amount of their life. So this is great news. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people very happy about it, and it fits in with the, you know, with the way the the entire government uh, on a national level is going. So uh, uh, all I can say is I I uh, think that's great. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Mary. Mary, go ahead. 
Yes, uh, Chief Kohawak, I know you've been very thoughtful on this issue. So I just think it would be really good in light of that you're asking for an understandable renewal for the uh, firing range. And you did talk about training. Since there's been so much concern across the country about police shootings, et cetera. And I know you all have been very good on this issue. Could you just say what measures you all are taking as part of training police that would address any concerns that the public might have about that? Yeah, we've, not just of, of late, but throughout the years, we focused on, on training in general, but also on use of force training, not just firearms. Uh, that's a last resort. So our training also focuses on avoiding you know, firearms at all. So we do a lot of de-escalation training. We're now in the process of completing. In fact, I just spoke to the deputy chief earlier today to schedule the rest of the department on de-escalation training for the balance of the, I believe it's about 70 or 75 officers who are still outstanding. And some of them are newer officers that missed the initial training. So we're completing that. But as far as firearms themselves, we do the minimum training, which was required by the state for the annual qualifications. We also do the low light training. In addition to that, we bring in a, a trailer called the Blue Line Trailer. It's a vehicle, it's a simulator in which the officers can participate in kind of real life scenarios. And as their actions, as they make decisions, the scenario changes depending on how they handle a situation. So it's not just uh, firearms, but use of force in general. And the instructors then adjust the scenario to the, based on how the officer handled it and then critiques the officer on how well they handled the situation and whether they de-escalated, whether the firearm was necessary, what level of force was utilized, how they could have possibly used less force if they handled it differently and that kind of thing. Um, we're also looking currently at an in-house system on a lease basis to bring that in that we can use on a regular basis, not just on an annual basis, which we do with the Blue Line trailer, but something we can bring officers in off the street and immediately just bring them in and have them go through those scenarios on a constant basis to keep them sharp. So it's, it's a focus that we've been working on constantly. Really, it comes down to resources and thankfully we've had that and we continue to, to focus on that using you know, city funds, capital budget funds and asset forfeiture funds through drug seizures. Very good, thank you. Any, any other questions for the chief or deputy chief or any other uh, of the capital? We're right here. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm just listening to what you're saying. Your focus then appears to be more of the escalation of force as opposed to more community involvement. Are you doing any programs that well, have the police more involved with the community as opposed to a focus on force and the de-escalation of force. Yeah, I think I've built my career on community policing and community outreach. I think one of the reasons I became deputy chief was my activities as the community police supervisor and then becoming chief as a result of my activities. Um, on a daily basis, we focus on the community. Unfortunately, with COVID, that's been more difficult we can't have the outreach programs, the hands-on programs, but I believe if you look back, um, I don't know many departments that do more outreach than we have over the past several years and continue to do, whether it's through the mentoring program, whether it's through the, the National Night Out, whether it's through Coffee with a Cop, um, whether it's through our, our annual holiday party, our giveaways, um, our SROs constantly work with the schools and work with the youth. Uh, myself, I'm a mentor of a, of a youth that's now at Brian McMahon that I've had since third grade. Um, so not only do I believe in it, but I live it. And that's something that we focus on and my, I want my department to focus on. We recently made a change in our community policing unit to bring in a lieutenant that I felt was gonna do even more for the community. <clears throat> and uh, so far that's worked out well. So that's an everyday, that's an everyday uh, focus of ours. And I'd be, oh, glad off, I'd be glad offline to, if you'd like to contact me offline, I'd be glad to sit down with you and go over, you know, more details of what we're doing. Chief, uh, you missed one. You missed Pal. Oh, yeah. I'm on the board of Pal as is, as is Deputy Chief Zeka. But, yeah, we also have a Pal program that runs a lot of youth programs and also donates money to, to fund youth programs in the city. Um, and the Police Explorers, our cadet program, which is for 14 and 20-year-old youth 
uh, which started when I was a deputy chief and focused on. So um, I'm really proud of what we've done in that area. Okay, anybody else? Tammy. Tammy. I'd just like to say um, to the chief that I also um, noticed that you guys are posting on Instagram. I'm curious if that's helpful. I mean, I think it's nice you pose alerts, you pose good things, post good things that are happening. Um, so, you know, you're reaching the community, maybe not in COVID in a hands-on way, but a lot of young people look at um, social media. Um, I'm, is it helping anything or? Yeah, we, we have thousands of followers on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Um, I started our social media program when I was a deputy chief nine years ago when it just started with Twitter and my lieutenants that have been in there, Lieutenant uh, Blake and Sergeant Galino have really run with that program and have expanded our social media reach. And we post several messages a day, not just alerts and things, but just community outreach, um, just some notes on what's going on. Um, and right now that has been a big focus because of COVID and not being able to reach out and actually meet with people like we did, you know, traditionally. So, um, in fact, early on in the COVID situation, I did a coffee with a cop through Instagram and Facebook Live because we couldn't meet with people. So, again, that's another focus that we've been using, and it has worked out well. And we have a large number of followers on that. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Unless there's any other question pertaining to the budget, anybody else? Just have one question um, to the chief. My concern, and perhaps this might be in a future budget, would be the training of police to determine a distinction between criminal behavior and mental health issues. I think that's very important for the community and for the police to make that distinction. So in the future, if this is an issue that comes before the budget in terms of training the police in order to be able to have a greater impact on the community, I would be very supportive of that. Actually, we, that we do within our operating budget, not through the capital, but the operating budget through our training budget has funding where we do crisis intervention training for officers to do just that. There's also a big push statewide to do a better job with recruits on mental health training because that has been a big focus as we've seen some tragic incidents that have occurred you know, in the state and elsewhere through that. So that is also another focus that we've worked on and continue we to actually, do. We actually currently have um, a couple of supervisors in a CIT class right now. That's been over a few weeks. Okay, Chief, Deputy Chief, thank you. And uh, that's it, thank you. All right, thanks. Thank have you. a good night, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, next we have the, uh, the fire department. We have uh, Fire Chief uh, Gino Gatto, Assistant Fire Chief Ed McCabe, and Assistant Fire Chief Al Bassett. Everybody in? Thank you very much, Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires. So would you like me to go through all my projects one by one? Well, we have, uh, well, it's, it's up to, Let's see. What are, we have a we have a sheet in our book here. We have all the projects and we have a prioritized list. Um, okay. It's up to it's up to you if you want to go page by page or you want to item by item. I, can, you... I will go through them. I will go through them, and if you have questions, we'll uh, we'll answer them one at a time. Okay. Very good. Okay. So the number one is the vehicle replacement. Um, looking to add a, another Ford Explorer for the new assistant chief's position that was um, just approved by the Board of Fire Commissioners. And the second one is a Ford Transit cargo van, which I'm looking to replace a 1989 E350 van that the fire marshals use for fire investigation. So this, it's, it's a real small, very uh, compact type van and they'll be able to carry their uh, equipment 
And uh, so when they come back for fire investigations, that would be the on-call vehicle that the uh, fire inspector will take with him when they're on call. So. So Chief, uh, the normal question, uh, is the Explorer Explorer gonna be hybrid? <laughs> That's a good question. The last time, the last time we purchased vehicles were in 2017. And the discussion then was through the mechanic, our fire mechanic, that battery replacement was very expensive. Um, disposal of batteries was an environmental issue. Um, so to be honest with you, I did not look at hybrid this year because I'm under the impression that, uh, you know, our mechanics work on gas vehicles and we pretty much keep our vehicles for a very long time and they do the maintenance on them in-house. So I don't know how cost effective uh, a hybrid would be. I can certainly look into it more. Chief, I, I think the, this is something the finance department could look into in any case, just to see where we are, because there's a lot of departments buying vehicles. It's just very interesting, but thank you. If you do look into it, it's gonna be interesting. But sooner or later, you will be moving to hybrids and your obviously your engineers, mechanics will obviously become conversant with them. Yeah, I'm sure it's, it's probably going that way. You're right. Um, may Thank I, you. May I say something, Fran? Yep, go ahead. The, uh, uh, hello, Chief. Uh, Hi. The, uh, I'm just doing this uh, minor research, but I, I'm entering it into the record now as per our chair. Um, and it's the same thing I just said earlier with the police vehicles, but it, I wanna reiterate, the maintenance of the hybrids is actually fairly simple. And uh, the, because the electrical systems are, apparently they're, they're easy to maintain. They don't really break down that much. And, uh, and the, the hybrid of course has a internal combustion engine on it as well, but the hybrid, the electric part of it, uh, I think is, is not a really should be an issue with the mechanics. Uh, one of the things that I found out was that the brakes, the hybrid vehicles use a uh, braking system that generates uh, uh, or that recharges the battery and it's called regener regenerative braking. And it actually uh, is a way to, uh, it saves the brakes uh, and that the brake maintenance is a lot less which I know, you know, when you're using these vehicles every day, like you are, the brakes I'm sure wear out pretty quickly. And that in the long run, the fuel and maintenance savings makes up for the increased cost of the hybrid. Uh, at least that's what all these departments are finding out. So I, I would really push to do hybrid, to follow the lead of the police department and let's get moving on that. I mean, I think that's really a great uh, thing. You know, there's, a, there's some imagery. I mean, some in, there's, it's an image thing as well, you know, the city is, uh, trying to move forward with new technology, but I think your mechanics would get on, could get on board. And um, uh, okay, I, I really would push. I would really push for that. I think it'd be great to to keep that. And you get a ten year warranty on a battery generally. So uh, at that point, you know, I guess you would decide. I know the resale is very high on the hybrid, so you could always go into the market and sell them and replace them at that point after ten years. I'm not sure, but I'm just throwing, okay. throwing this out. I'll, I'll definitely look into and do some more research on it. Thank you. One one thing for you, Mike. Mike, what, what are, are you submitting anything to the planning and zoning to be when you say entering into the record? Whatever is, article you're are you sending it in? No, I'm just uh, I'm entering it in the record verbally. Well, is that okay? And, and, and if you're referring to a specific article, it's it's. I mean, if you're if you're reading something that you're specifically um, quoting from, whatever it is, please send it in. Okay, so it's part of the material, if you will. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Chief. Continue, please. Okay. The second project apparatus replacement. Um, <clears throat> we're looking to replace. Uh, uh, one of our fire engines, which is a 2007 uh, pumper. 
and that will, um, the 2007 will actually replace a 2001 spare engine that we have. So if you remember back in 2017, we purchased a, a fire pumper and we have a schedule of replacement or frontline apparatus um, is replaced every 10 to 15 years, depending on what it is. So this year we're asking for 650,000 for a new engine. And then the following year to replace it, it would be the last replacement of our pumpers, which is 2009 pumper, next year's budget. And then in 2024, uh, replacing a 2009 our rescue truck that we have. So we have a 12 year replacement schedule. And, and these are just in line. And these have been in line, uh, you know, through the capital plan, five year plan. Question? Um, no, just uh, uh, in, in our book here, Chief, you know, it states that the next uh, next three items, you know, are new projects. So uh, please, I don't know if that's true or not. We found with the other department that they were listed as new, but they had been requested before. So just let right. us know if it's, if it's a brand new one. Okay. Okay. I had this, I had this question with Henry Dashowitz from the finance. And he said to me, why did you put new? And I said, I put new because it's new for us. I mean, well, there's, a project, there's a project ID number that this category apparatus replacement, you know, stays with us, but it's, it's a new item. So am I doing that wrong? No, if it's, we didn't see this before, we didn't see it last year, right? For this one item? No. Okay, so if it wasn't on the list last year, then it's a it's a new item. Okay, but it was on it, it was on two years ago. Okay, so two years ago it was on. Then what? You took it off last year? Well, because we didn't buy an engine last year. We didn't, didn't buy a, it. Didn't get approved. No, no, no. We did not put in for it last year. The replacement is is coming up this year. And then I don't know what the answer is, if it should, you know, in our minds, my mind, when I see something new, is it that thing that we've never seen before? That's how we've dealt with it in the past. So anyway, when, when Henry uh, is in front of us, he can speak to it. Okay. Okay. Continue. Go ahead. Rain, could I just ask a clarifying question? Is there more yes. than one, is there more than one boat that you have to fulfill that function? You're talking about the boat that we're asking for? Yes. Is there more than one boat that you use for that function? We have we have two boats in our marine division. Okay. And I'll, you want if you can wait, I'll explain it. Mary, it's we're okay. On, we're on number three right now, I believe. My apologies. Okay. Sorry, Fran. That's Actually, okay. the boat's coming up now. Okay. Okay. So we're we're looking. Uh, we have two boats in our marine division. Uh, a a thirty-eight foot. Uh, jet drive and 24 foot 1987 uh, to 24 foot privateer boat. It used to be a police boat that uh, we got a hold of and refurbished it and we had it. We've been using it for many, many years. Um, again, this is now getting to the end of its life. Um, so Deputy Chief Prescott put this package together for it's a 25 foot, it's a refurbished um, Coast Guard boat <clears throat> that they auction off uh, every year. Uh, you know, they're older boats. And um, so the boat, uh, the electronics, the fire pump, a trailer comes out to 195. Um, but to answer your question, it's, it's to allow us to get into shallow waters around, around all the different islands and it's to replace that 1987 boat that we have. We have a bigger boat, a, a 30, uh, 38 foot. Yeah, I just wanted to know what the fleet was. I just didn't know how many boats you had. That was all my question was, yeah. it was really simple. Okay. 
And good job saving the lives of those boaters last year. I think that was you guys, or combined with police. But out yeah, by uh, Sheff Sheffield Island, uh, I, that boat went down fast. Yeah. We're, a lot of times we work together with the police department. <clears throat> um, with us, we're we're you know we're on duty and we're in the stations if we're not on a call. Uh, a lot of the marine, uh, the police marine unit, they have to if they're off duty. There's nobody manning their police boat. So we have our firefighters in our station three that are all, you know, trained to operate and they're all trained captains for the boat. So next one. Yeah, keep going until the, unless you hear a question. Okay. Sorry, the next one question. is the boat that you're getting an old boat that's been refurbished or a brand new boat? It's not brand new. Okay. It's, it, so it's a Coast Guard. It's a Coast Guard refurbished boat. Okay. Yes. Yep. I read the description, but I wasn't. Just wanted to make one hundred percent certain. Thank you. Okay. Next project. Um, every one of our frontline fire engines carries what we call foam, uh, aqueous film forming foam. They come in five gallon buckets, and. It's basically to um, we use it for uh, flammable liquids that are spilled or flammable liquid fire. So it's like they're all class B foams. Um, a couple of years ago, the, uh, the DEP and EPA came out with a notice that the foams that we carry now are they have a substance called polyfluorinated alkyl substances. So PFAS is the acronym. Um, the recommendation from both of these agencies is do not use foam. Do not use foam that has this product in it. Um, do not use the foam for training. Do not use the foam unless it's a life hazard uh, condition. And every fire department, not just NOG fire department, every fire department has to replace their own inventory of foam. And, and this is what this project is, is for 35 five gallon pails. Um, How long does that last you, Chief? I mean, it's 19. It's a 10, it's um, uh, Assistant Chief Bassett who's on the call could explain a little better. I believe it's is it ten or twelve years shelf life for the foam. The I mean, is foam. this what I'm saying? Is is this enough? I mean, I don't know how. You know, thirty five. How, how long is that? Would that last you? Should you well, be buying more? That's what I'm asking. We would only buy more if we had, if we had to use it up, and uh, it's it's not something that you're going to use on a daily basis. That's for sure. We haven't used foam probably in a in a maybe six or seven, eight, nine months ago. So, I mean, if we have to purchase more of a part, we would buy it, uh, you know, small containers uh, through the operating budget. But for now, we're, we just want to replace everything that we have in stock and do away with that foam that has that, those chemicals in it because it's environmental, it's a, it's a environmental hazard as well as uh, causes cancer. Okay, so does this order here take care of, of getting rid of all the stuff that you got to get rid of? Yes. As a replacement. Okay. Yes. I'm good. Okay. Keep going. Okay. Next one is what we call high pressure rescue bags. So on our rescue truck, High pressure airbags. And high pressure airbags, the brief description is used to, to lift uh, vehicles, anything that's that's uh, extremely heavy. If you had a motive, you know, if you had an accident and people were trapped under a, a vehicle or two vehicles on top of each other, things like that, um, these bags are used for extrication purposes. Um, do you have all the information that I attached to it? There's, um, a, there's, a, there's a description from the yeah. manufacturer. Yes, we do. Yes. We uh, anyway, 
depending on how much you have to lift, there's 14 bags in a set. They go from lifting of three inches all the way up to 20 inches. So these bags are past or very near their replacement uh, schedule. Uh, ours are over 12 years old. Uh, the, the, the manufacturer, the rubber manufacturer does not recommend using them after 15 years. So we put in now for replacement of those bags. No question? Well, I, does this take care of the order? I mean, or are you... Um... This, will, this will replace what we have currently in, in our inventory. So we have 14 now, we're gonna replace with, with 14 new ones. Okay, go ahead. Okay, the, this number six is security cameras and intercom system. Uh, I believe two years ago, uh, we put in for $20,000 for security cameras. Um, everybody, you guys approved it, the council approved it. Um, we still have that money because we have been in, in um, looking into the um, additional security that we need around the stations. So again, Assistant Chief Bassett was involved with this project. Um, he met with uh, a couple of vendors and uh, suggestions were made as to putting cameras in certain locations because uh, we because the the original request was not enough money, so I'm putting in for another additional <clears throat> twenty, which would cover all the entrances of all the firehouses for security. Together with the money that you got last year. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Because I remember this discussion about security. Okay. Go ahead. Next one you is know, where those where those cameras are monitored. Like if the firehouse is locked, who's watching the cameras? Uh, Al, do you want to answer that? Yeah, uh, based on the um, the bid that we're putting out, it would be recorded in the firehouse. There would be nobody watching them live if the firehouse was vacant. So we would be able to go back and and get the. Um, get the uh, footage of anything happen. The, um, yeah. do the doorbells, the doorbells would be alive to our communication center if somebody rang the doorbell. Or Very similar to the current uh, residential ring doorbell system. Yeah, right. Yeah, we, we're not planning on a camera on the uh, doorbell right now. Um, that wasn't part of it. I didn't look into that. Uh, we're just looking at the voice um for the doorbell direct into dispatch it's a little, a little easier for that costly for cost wise to do that i didn't look at camera into dispatch how many, are the, how many are the, of this twenty thousand dollars how many doorbell or cameras are you getting uh total between the five stations it would be roughly 18 18 cameras would be on it uh, they'd be recorded at each firehouse. Uh, only specific administrators would have access remotely through uh, you know, iPhone or iPad uh, to get into those. Otherwise, you would have to uh, just watch it at the firehouse. Thank you. Now, are, the, are firehouses, uh, are they ever uh, just locked, vacant? If, there, if uh, apparatus is on the call, yes. Okay. So if they're out in an incident, no one's there. Okay, but this is to get just for Tammy's uh, clarification. This twenty thousand is together with last year's twenty thousand will allow to buy you all those cameras. Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, Chief. Keep going. Okay. The next one is the used tractor for hazmat trailer. So, um. In my finance uh, meetings, the fire, uh, the finance director uh, gave the approval to put in for a used tractor. So again, Assistant Chief Bassett is our hazmat uh, 
hazmat subject expert and uh, our hazmat, Al, do you want to describe what the uh, hazmat regional trailer is? Sure. So uh, Norwalk's part of a regional hazmat team, uh, 14 cities and towns. Uh, the primary rig is uh, maintained by Westport Fire Department. And they were, that's where it's uh, housed. We have a, a, a supplemental rig along with a piece of apparatus along with uh, Stratford also has a, a supplemental piece of apparatus. So, you know, we, the, we get a lot of funding for grant money for equipment that we have on our trailer. We actually had, a, we have a donated trailer that we maintain. And this would be the, um, the tractor that would pull it. The current one's a 1987 refurbished pumper that we will be um, replacing. So we're looking to buy a used, uh, you know, automatic single axle. It meets all the DOT safety uh, inspections. Um, and because we have our in-house mechanics, uh, we feel it's a lot. We could we could um, justify a used one as opposed to spending, you know, four times or five times as much for a new one. Yeah, but what did, what did you mean by uh, uh, working with Stratford and Westport? What does that mean? When there's a hazmat issue, yeah. they come in, Stratford comes in. And Correct. Yes, we're, we're on a, um, as a regional hazmat team, uh, we would get paged out if we had an incident in Norwalk. That apparatus would respond, but we would get response from uh, 14 other towns also, 13 other towns. So it's a regional approach to uh, hazardous materials. Same thing with the foam, actually. That's why we don't need a, a, a the, go back to the foam. We don't need as much foam as we used to because of the regional assets that we have that's back up what we carry on our frontline pieces. Very good. Thank you. So if another another fire department in the region has a hazmat incident and they need that trailer in Norwalk, we have to respond with it and bring it to them. I just thought, okay, thank you. You're welcome. The next one is an item that is not new, even though it says new. Um, various station repairs. We. Uh, since I've been uh, in this position, every year we put in the, the budget for thirty-five thousand dollars for station repairs. I mean, we have you know five fire stations. We have the maintenance garage. We have a training tower, and I don't have to tell you it's like your house. You know, every, you're always something's always breaking. You're always fixing something, and that's all this is. Just just. An extra thirty-five thousand for repairs. You've talked about it every year, Chief. Yes, you're right. <laughs> okay, the last one. Um, the last one is a roof replacement for Metal Street Firehouse, which is our station number five. Uh, the fire station was built in 1969. It has the original roof still on it. Well, it was a 25 year roof and I think it's time that it gets replaced. Um, it is leaking. Uh, we have repaired it in the past and we just decided that we should uh, go ahead and, and put it in to uh, see when we can get it replaced. This 145 is just an estimate from a roofing company. Um, obviously we'd have to go out to bid and it could either be more or it could be less. Um, if, if and when we do it, but it's pretty straightforward uh, roof placement. Okay, thank you. Are there You're any uh, questions? Are there any questions um, for the chief here on these requests from anybody? Um, a comment. Go ahead, yes, sir. Hi, uh, chief. I want to just tell you the maintenance garage looks amazing. And uh, I get, I think you got new doors on it. Didn't we talk about that last year? Did, you, did well, you new doors? not not all of them, but we're we're replacing them little by little. So and, yeah, and the, uh, it was um, not approved last year. Oh, 
I thought we did. Well, I guess it didn't make it through. You, no, I think the planning commission approved it, but uh, the mayor took it out. So, uh, and the other thing is the, the uh, this is just an aside, but the maintenance, the landscape maintenance at the headquarters is top notch. So I want to thank all you guys because it's, you know, it's my pet thing. I drive by there when I go to Speedy Donuts and it used to be weedy and messy and it looks really good. So, well, we're going to, you know, obviously it's, it's a fairly new building. We take pride in it and we need to do a little better job because the weeds do take over a lot. So we're going to pay a little extra attention this year on it. But I'd recommend the flamethrower flame uh, weed killer because you guys are <laughs> perfect for it. You can get training and kill the weeds yeah. at the same time. It'd be a hazmat incident. <laughs> <clears throat> I think Mike is volunteering to come in and uh, fix uh, you know, the landscaping, right, Mike? I did that yeah. a lot for many years. It just helped out, helped out around there. Just donated it, but no, there there was confusion from the park. I guess it was the parks department and DPW, and the, you guys got all that straightened out. Yeah. They were supposed to be doing it, and they didn't. So, yeah, all right. Doing it now. Okay, I don't hear anybody else. So, uh, thank you, Chief. Thank, thank you. you. Nice to nice to see you. Nice to see you thank too. You. Be well. Okay, thank you. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we're going to embark on the um, on the on the board of ed. Okay, uh, this is uh, Tom Hamilton. If you want me to start, I'm ready to start. Um, most hey, of. Tom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a comment to you. Okay. Yeah. Only, because, only because I've known you from when you came on with Mayor Knopf, okay? When he stole you from Stanford. Long time ago. <laughs> Long time ago. And we, and we love you, okay? That's why we accepted all your changes, three times worth of changes here, okay? So we're... We means extending. everybody, Fran. Huh? <laughs> we means everyone. We means everyone, okay? Otherwise, you know... Um, so we uh, appreciate you being thorough, but you make it a little bit, it's, um, you know, it's difficult to review things. So yeah. because, I know, go ahead. Uh, the uh, the uh, schedule uh, is a little bit uh, off kilter. Our board actually didn't act on the uh, capital budget until I think it was uh, a week ago, uh, which is why those changes came in. Uh, we obviously needed to reflect uh, uh, the action of uh, the board uh, on the budget. So we had originally submitted the superintendent's request and then uh, submitted the revised uh, pages after the board acted. But in any event, let me uh, begin. Uh, we do have a presentation and hopefully it looks like I should be able to share this. And I'm going to uh, walk you through really a summary of our requests and we do have a, a pretty large team here with us. So let me first uh, acknowledge the folks uh, and hopefully I won't miss anyone, but uh, we do have the superintendent of schools with us, uh, Dr. Estrella. And I'm sure at some point during the evening, she'll uh, you know, have some words to uh, say. Uh, we also have our board chair, uh, Colin Hostin and two other board members. I saw uh, Diana Carpio and Barbara Meyer Mitchell. Uh, we have our chief of school operations who oversees uh, facilities, uh, Dr. Frank Costanzo. Uh, we have our chief communications officer, uh, Brenda Wilcox uh, Williams. Uh, we have our chief of digital learning, uh, who you're quite familiar with, uh, Ralph Valencisi, who oversees uh, technology. And we have our facilities director, uh, Bill Hodell, uh, on the call as well. If I missed any folks uh, representing the Board of Ed, uh, please jump in and introduce yourself. Okay, I think I, I think I have everyone. Hopefully I got everyone. Okay, I'm gonna tell the commission, um, if you see it through, uh, if you don't mind, Tom, unless you wanna get through, if they have questions, they can stop you or you wanna wait till 
the, um, the, I would rec I, I would prefer if we kind of get through the presentation, which I think we can do in you know pretty short order, and then op really open it up for questions. There's only uh, seven slides here, and I'm not going to talk at length on each project. I'm really going to kind of sort of set the stage, if you will. And then we can talk about them project by project and answer any questions. We are going to talk on the first project here a little bit longer, uh, just because it is one of the larger requests and and uh, it's uh, one of the newer requests. So we will talk about a couple of the projects in some detail, uh, and then. Uh, but really, this is a summary. So. Um, Okay, go ahead and we'll, we'll ask questions after you're done, okay? okay. So, so the slide that I have up on the screen is the summary of the capital budget requests for 21-22. Uh, so as you can see, the total requests uh, add up to $15.3 million. However, there are uh, a number of projects that are eligible for partial reimbursements, primarily through the state uh, school construction program. And uh, we would anticipate about $1.7 million of uh, reimbursement, uh, which means the Board of Education's net request is $13,655,000. Uh, over the entire five-year period, and typically uh, most of the focus is on the upcoming year, the 21-22 year, but over the total five-year period, uh, the Board of Education request totals uh, $85.1 million. We anticipate reimbursements or revenues of $13.3 million, and therefore the net amount uh, of the request or the net amount that the city would have to bond is $71.8 million over the five years. Um, so I'm going to talk, uh, you know, again briefly about, uh, you know, we'll walk through each of these projects, uh, and focus on uh, first the uh, uh, Briggs Family Welcome Center. Uh, so the B Briggs Family Welcome Center is uh, the largest project that we've requested uh, for next year, and uh, we've requested it really for a number of reasons. Uh, one is our current uh, student registration system is really a, a challenge for many of our families, many of our parents, many of our students, because it really is a bit of a convoluted process that people have to navigate their way through. And it's not something that they're familiar with how to go about doing. Uh, so what we're looking to do is really create a unified uh, single one-stop shop where most of our or all of our really parent facing and student facing interfaces uh, can be housed. So it would provide central registration for kindergarten students as well as any uh, families that are new to Norwalk. It would uh, incorporate our uh, multi-language learner uh, services and welcome center, uh, which provides testing and other services for multi-language learners. Uh, it would provide a special education ombudsperson and bilingual social worker uh, who would be able to help uh, students and families who may uh, have uh, special education needs and uh, allow them to get uh, connected to the uh, uh, transportation office for um, parents that uh, need uh, bus transportation for their students. Our student health services would be housed there, which again is part of the registration process. Students have to uh, be properly vaccinated and, and uh, so forth. And so that would also be housed there. Food services uh, would also be housed in the Family Welcome Center. Uh, and again, we have, uh, um, you know, a need for many of our families to apply for uh, assistance uh, with uh, free and reduced price meals. And so we would provide assistance to those families there. Uh, the technology depot would be located there. Uh, and we have now moved as a district to a one-to-one -one, uh, device 
uh, environment where all students are, you know, have a uh, device. And so this would be the uh, venue uh, that we would uh, distribute those devices from. Uh, student records uh, would be housed there, uh, which uh, again uh, uh, is uh, part of our family facing operation. And then subsidiary volunteer and family support programming services, other community services uh, would also be housed there. Uh, it's a great location located uh, directly on a city bus line. It's a prominent property that you probably are all familiar with and have driven past many times. Unfortunately, the building really is underutilized and it is, um, you know, not in very good shape and it doesn't, uh, you know, it's not really being used to its fullest potential. So we see this as really a great way to um, move that uh, building uh, into a really productive use. And I think the, the superintendent, uh, um, do you have, uh, you wanted to add uh, some, some comments here, Alex? Sure, so um, I don't know if um, the members of this panel have been um, listening in and tuning into a lot of our conversations around the work that we're trying to do um, for the district, especially around the strategic plan and kind of rethinking, reimagining the work for our schools. And the Welcome Center will serve kind of as the entry point or intersection to reset our values for our families and the, in our system at large. It will help us set the tone when our families come for the first time or for repeated services within our organization. And one of the things that we want to do is have the opportunity to have a place that feels like home rather than an institution. And the Briggs building affords us that opportunity because it, it's a site that has a, a homey feel, but also has easy accessibility for all of our families, despite their social emotional standing and um, situation. It will also provide us with um, a, a place where our families and their children can begin the process of tiered support like um, Mr. Th uh, Hamilton mentioned. And I believe that it is the beginning of, of, the, of us emerging into something really great because it's gonna pay attention um, to the needs of our, our, of our children. It will set a, a stage for a new set of uh, processes that focus on the empathy that we need for the diverse needs of, of the population that we're serving. And it will change the conversation across Norwalk to, th to start thinking more about what we need to do for our community to ensure that we offer equitable services and processes across the system. Um, I, I believe that the infrastructure and space where our families and students are greeting in matters, environment matters. And you'll see today throughout the conversation, not only about the Welcome Center, but other pieces of the capital plan, focus on building what we currently have to make it better so that our families feel when they enter our organization that they are um, valued and cared for in the way that they deserve. So uh, as, as you look at this project, I know that the BRICS project is something new, but it's something necessary um, for us to effectively provide the services that our families need, especially as our community continues to diversify, both in, in terms of um, the ethnic demographics of the of, of Norwalk at large, but also in the social economic um, dynamics that have emerged as a result of that. Um, I'm going to also have Brenda. I don't know if uh, if Brenda has anything to add because she's been pivotal in um, collaborating in the design of the Welcome Center. We can't. You're muted. Common Dr. Estrella, I think you, you covered it very nicely. Just a, a couple of additional points. Um, this is actually very consistent. The whole concept is very consistent with the city's emphasis on customer service in the POCD. 
um, as well as the city's emphasis on equity, just like the district is emphasizing equity in the coming years. We really need to um, improve the way that we bring our families into the school system. Right now, we are bumping them all over the place. They, they go to their school to register here. They may have to go to the city hall to fill out a form. They go somewhere else to take tests. Um, it is extremely confusing and um, not um, a really good process at all because we have these folks who are really critical services for our families located in so many different locations. Um, you know, the other part of this too, and Dr. Australia mentioned having a really family friendly welcome center. Uh, we just don't have the space available in a layout that makes sense available in city hall. Um, and we also know that um, City Hall, it's, it's a, an absolutely gorgeous building, um, but it's also extremely intimidating if you are um, either new to the school system, you are reluctant to, um, you know, to, to you know, come into a building where there might be security. Um, and it's really, it really creates a barrier to our, our relationships um, with a lot of our families. So it's really, uh, it's really important that we have something that is friendlier and more welcoming and that can be um, kind of a hub for all our parents throughout the district. And then last but not least, is just really putting that building back into an effective use. Um, anybody who's been in Norwalk for some time knows the history of the Briggs building, naming it after Dr. Briggs, one of our former superintendents. Um, there is no ability to put it back into use as a school, and it's really just sitting there. Um, I think Tom used the word decrepit in his, um, in his slide, and that, that truly is what it is, but this can truly be turned into something um, that all of us in the city can be proud of instead of just having that as an empty building sitting in a very um, prominent location on, you know, Old Route 7. So that's, uh, that's all I have to add to that. Thank okay. you, Brenda. We'll turn it over to you now, Tom. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Estrella, and thank you, Brenda. So the other project uh, I did want to highlight here, and I will ask uh, Dr. Estrella as well if she wants to make any comments when I'm finished here, uh, is uh, this is not a project for next year. So this is a project that is put in the 25 and 26 years of the plan. <clears throat> and uh, so it's still several years out. This is, you know, a discussion point at this point, if you will, but we did think uh, it was important to highlight this. And it really gets back to the issue uh, that Dr. Estrella and, and Brenda Williams have both commented upon, which is making sure that we're really meeting uh, the needs of all of our students and that uh, uh, we're providing you know, options and, and pathways for our students, uh, you know, regardless of, uh, you know, what uh, uh, direction they may be uh, taking in their life. And so this is a um, project um, which is fairly substantial, uh, amounts to about $45 million is the estimate, but it again is in uh, fiscal year 24 and fiscal year 25, uh, but it is to provide a new school to career option, a career and technical high school that would provide uh, work-based le uh, learning opportunities. And the intention is to complement the state technical high school system, uh, not to compete with the state system, but to uh, potentially focus on uh, areas that the state system does not focus on. For instance, one of the things that's been talked about is the notion of the uh, marine industries um, and whether, you know, with the uh, Norwalk uh, still having uh, an oystering industry and a boating industry, uh, whether or not there are opportunities to look at uh, uh, career pathways uh, within marine services uh, and marine sciences uh, as, uh, as one potential pathway for uh, students who, who are looking for careers in that area. So the notion is really to focus on uh, training and industry certifications, uh, tying together uh, what uh, the state of Connecticut, uh, the governor has recently come out with some objectives 
in terms of uh, workforce uh, development and uh, workforce training and to really tie in with that uh, initiative uh, to make sure that we are positioning Norwalk uh, so that we're you know one serving the needs of all of our students and and really making sure that we're, we're providing uh, Norwalk with the future workforce uh, that it needs that we're doing our part uh, to ensure that the workforce uh, that our industries need uh, to, to uh, succeed in the future uh, are being trained here in Norwalk. Uh, so again, I wanna just ask if the superintendent wants to add anything uh, to that. Uh, we are hoping uh, as we go forward that, uh, that there may be opportunities to partner with the state in terms of uh, looking at uh, uh, the funding and financing of this initiative. So this is still you know, very much a concept uh, that we want to flesh out further in the coming years. Uh, but uh, again, we thought it was important to put it on the table. Well, thank you, Tom. So I, I think you articulated all the key points. Uh, the one thing I would add is that, um, as many of you probably know, when Briggs was uh, dismantled, uh, the community felt that there was, there was a gap left mm -hmm. for students that uh, were interested in alternative pathways. And the school would provide um, students with alternative pathways to uh, c uh, career and, and um, beyond. And like Tom articulated, it directly ties to um, the governor's workforce council initiative particularly in the concept of partnering with K-12 and post-secondary educational institutions to ensure um, educational systems have accessible, equitable, and, and aligned pathways um, within the school structure. So our goal with this program is to afford alternative opportunities for students that see themselves in career pathways that do not necessarily require a college education, but more of a certification or alternative um, apprenticeship to, to develop the skills necessary to, to engage in the work. Um, we're also looking at the possibility of making this a little bit different from other um, structures where we would um, extend the pathway potentially to middle school grade students that might be at risk, but show an interest in particular um, pathways that would be offered within um, the Korean Technical High School. Particularly looking at, similar to what the, the, the governor's workforce uh, is trying to do, pathways that are aligned to industries that are currently in Norwalk and will continue to be in Norwalk beyond um, the next few years and will need um, individuals to have the necessary training to continue those industries within our community. So our hopes uh, with this program is that it becomes a community collaborative process to ensure that all of our students are successful because we're providing multiple options for them beyond the college and career pathway to ensure that all of our students are successful. Okay, thank you, Dr. Estrella. So I will move on and the next slide really has all the rest of our capital projects listed together. So I will move through these more quickly so that we can then uh, get to, uh, to answer your questions. And these are, uh, the projects are in the order that they're in your capital budget book as well. And almost all of these are projects that you have seen before and our continuation of existing projects. So these are not new items, but continuation of funding for uh, existing uh, projects. Um, we have uh, curriculum materials and textbooks, uh, which you have seen before and is a continuation. Uh, we did add uh, the purchase of uh, culturally relevant library materials uh, to this request. And I would note that uh, at this point, 53% uh, of our student population is Latinx, about 25% uh, is white, 15% uh, 
black, 4% Asian, and 3% multiracial. So we have a very diverse student body. And it's really important that students uh, be able to uh, see themselves in the materials that we have in our libraries. And so, so that uh, particular request is to uh, make sure that we've got uh, current, uh, up-to-date and relevant uh, materials in our libraries. Uh, instructional technology is also one that you've uh, uh, seen before. And uh, we have uh, now moved to a one-to-one -one replacement of devices. And uh, Ralph Valencisi is on the call. And when we finish the presentation, I'll, you will probably come back to these. And, and Ralph can certainly go into more depth on uh, that particular request. Uh, the air conditioning program, and I've got a couple more slides on that because I know that is a uh, concern of uh, some of the uh, commissioners. And uh, so we have uh, um, proposed, uh, actually our board has uh, uh, proposed uh, funding uh, the air conditioning program next year at $750,000. The asbestos abatement program, our board has proposed expanding that and that is uh, a program we have uh, um, schools that have uh, still a significant amount of uh, asbestos containing uh, flooring in particular and unfortunately in a number of schools the flooring has reached the point where we literally have to uh, put duct tape down on our floors in order to um, keep the tiles from chipping and coming up and that really is not an acceptable place to be. So our board has actually increased the request for asbestos abatement to expedite uh, uh, the rollout of that program. And uh, so they've requested uh, $1,250,000 in each of the next three years, and then followed by a million uh, the year after that and 500,000 the year after that. And that would then complete the asbestos abatement program over the next five years. Um, bathroom renovation is the only project on here that is a new project, uh, but it is a very important one. Uh, and uh, I believe our updated sheets that uh, we talked about earlier, Fran, actually contains the updated information uh, on uh, the bathrooms uh, that would be renovated uh, over the next uh, several years. But again, our board um, has identified this as a high priority and has increased the request for bathroom renovation to $1.5 million request for next year. Uh, and the following two years uh, at 1.5 million followed by a million dollars and then a million dollars. And that would again, complete our bathroom renovation work over the next five years. Uh, many of our bathrooms in our facilities are, and th these are primarily the gang bathrooms that we're you know, talking about, although in some cases it's both gang bathrooms and individual stall bathrooms, uh, but it, many of the bathrooms are literally original to the buildings. So these are bathrooms that are from the 1950s or early 60s and they look it. Uh, we have doors that don't shut, we have missing doors, we have uh, rusted out partitions, we have um, you know, uh, um, toilets that don't flush. Uh, so we really uh, have an issue with bathrooms to the point that uh, students uh, don't wanna use uh, the bathrooms uh, in some cases because they're in such poor condition. Um, fuel tank replacement is a continuation of a program that was funded last year. And that is necessary in order to meet uh, environmental uh, regulations that require replacement of fuel tanks after a certain number of years. Uh, we do have Bill Hodell on the call who can talk at more length about these, uh, but uh, for next year, uh, that includes uh, Tracy Columbus and West Rocks. Uh, emergency capital repairs, similar to the fire department's capital repair account that uh, you heard about earlier, and the city has a similar account uh, in, in the city building management department uh, with uh, 20 buildings uh, that uh, there's always something that needs uh, repair or replacement. And uh, we have received funding uh, from the city in the past 
for this account. Uh, this account is now essentially fully exhausted. And uh, in order to meet uh, the expected emergency repairs going forward, uh, we're requesting uh, funding for uh, in the amount of $250,000 uh, to replenish that account. Uh, we have a uh, continuation of the cafeteria and kitchen upgrades, uh, although um, we have requested uh, to move that project out by one year. Uh, so that request is actually not for 21-22, uh, but we have a request in for 22-23, and then the two subsequent years after that for 23-24 and 24-25 and that is to provide um, upgraded kitchen facilities so, so that we can do more scratch cooking and to upgrade the cafeterias in order to um, make the cafeterias less institutional and more family friendly, uh, more family oriented with uh, you know, round uh, tables and separate chairs and other uh, you know, accoutrements, uh, some, in some cases, uh, uh, sound deadening uh, uh, equipment to uh, uh, sort of reduce the noise in cafeterias and so on. But with the pandemic and the need to, uh, you know, keep students out of cafeterias for this year, uh, our board has pushed back that request uh, to, uh, again, so there is no request for next year for uh, cafeterias. Uh, paving and ADA compliance is an ongoing uh, program uh, to uh, pave our parking lots and to repair our sidewalks and to make sure that our sidewalks and entryways are in compliance uh, with the American with Disabilities Act. Um, district vehicles, um, Bill Hodell can talk further about that, but there is a request to replace an existing vehicle that is, I believe, 17 years old and, and is uh, desperately in need of replacement. Uh, and then uh, finally for 21-22 um, uh, is the Silvermine Driveway uh, project uh, that our board has requested funding for 21-22 uh, to proceed uh, with that project. And you may recall that project uh, was one that was first requested last year. Uh, the city did approve design money in the uh, 2021 capital budget. And uh, so we have requested and our board has requested 1.5 million for the construction funds for next, uh, uh, next year. And that really is a safety issue and is an issue to address what is really a severe uh, congestion in the parking lot. We have students who have to cross in front of cars in order to get into the school building. And uh, so we're looking to, uh, you know, improve that situation as much as possible. I did want to give you an update on air conditioning. And because uh, I know that's been a uh, ongoing uh, con uh, concern of the commission. And um, as you'll recall, the district's approach has been to fully air condition with central air uh, any schools where we are doing a either new construction or renovation as new. Uh, so the buildings that are presently fully air conditioned include Brian McMahon High School, Norwalk High School, Ponus Ridge School, uh, both the upper and lower buildings at Ponus Ridge are now fully air conditioned and that is a, uh, a new, uh, you know, that is, that is new to that school this year. The middle school being air conditioned, obviously the lower school uh, building, which is presently being used um, by Jefferson uh, is uh, um, fully air conditioned as well since that building was brand new. Uh, Brookside Elementary School is fully air conditioned. Uh, Jefferson, uh, is fully air conditioned. The new building, uh, when it's renovated as new, will have new air conditioning in that building. Uh, Marvin is air conditioned and the Norwalk Early Childhood Center has central air conditioning. 
Uh, then the district's approach, given the magnitude of the cost to put in central air in all of our buildings uh, is very substantial. Um, and uh, we just don't have the resources to put in central air in all of our buildings. So what we have been doing is air conditioning the classrooms and other, uh, you know, limited other spaces uh, with window units and in some cases with these um, modular units like you might see in a, um, a hotel or a motel room. Um, and so where we have classrooms air conditioned includes Columbus Elementary School, Cranberry Elementary School, Fox Run, uh, Kendall, Roten Middle School, which is new, uh, that was done this year, and Silver, Silver Mine Elementary School is currently in process to get that air conditioning and that will certainly be done before uh, uh, next uh, spring. And so what uh, remains uh, are the, the schools listed here. Uh, obviously, as we build new schools, Jefferson, Cranberry, and Columbus would be fully air conditioned. And then we would expect to put in um, the um, classroom air conditioning at uh, Nathan Hale, Wolf Pit, Naramek, uh, West Rocks, and Rowayton. So that concludes the presentation. And I want to see if there's any other members of our team that wanted to add anything. And then uh, obviously um, uh, we're here and available for questions. We can go through, you know, project by project uh, if, if you'd like. Unless your team has uh, wants to add anything, Tom, I'm, uh, I'm going to open it up to um, the commissions. I, I, I don't necessarily need to go page by page. I, I'd rather have whatever the commissioner want to ask. And um, I have some questions myself, but I'm going to yield to the team first. And um, does anybody, um, there must be, I'm sure there are questions. So. Well, let me ask you this. Is anybody else from your team that wishes to speak? Okay, I don't hear anybody. So the, the planning commission, opening up to the commissioners to ask questions and um, let's go it one by one. Go ahead. Anybody wants to start? Yeah, my general question would be to what extent are we introducing more environmentally friendly technology, basically solar, which I don't see anywhere in here, even though I understand a lot of the rest of it is very necessary. Um, yes, we are um, adding solar. We, we've uh, done solar um, at uh, Naramac, which is up and operational and generating electricity. Uh, we have um, a uh, proposal and plan in place at uh, Ponus Ridge. And I guess I'll ask Bill if he has an update on that. Uh, we have a proposal and expectation to move forward with solar power at Jefferson. And as we do new buildings, we expect that we will have uh, solar panels at every new school where we have a new roof to work with, essentially. Right. Um, Bill, did I, could I ask you to jump in here and talk a little bit about the solar? Sure. Um, solar is active, as you just mentioned, uh, Tom, at Naramac, and that's working well. Uh, we have a contract we're still negotiating to install solar at the Ponus new school. Uh, but not on the original school with the original roof. And as you mentioned, Jefferson uh, being as renovated as new, which will also get a brand new roof, there are a discussion to install solar at Jefferson. And there's also some discussion about maybe carports um, as well or in lieu of. So we're not finally um, uh, determined what we're going to do at Jefferson yet. But yes, there is a discussion in place to go solar wherever the possibilities arise. Yeah, so let me add that the reason you don't see it in the capital budget request is because these projects are typically done 
as energy performance contracts. And they are financed um, by the vendor who puts in the solar array. And uh, they also have uh, uh, certain tax credits that the vendors are able to take advantage of as part of that financing, which helps bring down the net cost of the project. And <clears throat> then they're done as what's referred to as an energy performance contract where the company uh, and the district enter into a uh, power purchase agreement, typically for a 15 or 20 year period that says we agree to buy the power uh, that's generated by these solar panels from the uh, uh, company at a fixed rate. Uh, and uh, generally, I think the, the Naramac deal had a fixed rate of, um, well, I'm trying to remember, I think it was about five and a half or, or six cents per kilowatt. Does that sound right, uh, Bill? Or maybe it was, maybe it was even less than that. I'm not sure off the top of my head, but it's essentially less than the price that we currently are paying for electricity and the price is locked in for a 15 or 20 year period. And so that's essentially mm -hmm. the financing mechanism that underwrites the capital cost to install the solar. So it's really not our capital expense. It is the solar uh, vendors capital expense that they then have underwritten through this long-term power purchase agreement that we have entered into them with them. And they've also underwritten based on tax credits that are available to them. Thanks, Tom. Yep. Okay, Diane? go ahead. Um, so I have a couple of questions, but I don't have to do them all at once. I wanna start with the no, family. Mary, 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 ask, ask them as you, uh, as you are, okay? Okay. Ask, ask them, yeah. All right, so for the Family Center, uh, I just wanna say that uh, this is definitely extremely good practice. I think really forward-thinking districts have been trying to do this for 20 years. So I'm really glad to hear about this. Uh, I have a couple of questions, which is, I would like to follow up about what's the green construction considered for that project. I'd also like to know how much space is being considered for community partners because some of the services are not gonna be services that are supplied by the schools. And for these family centers to work, I think it's really important to be able to include on-site space for um, important community partners. So that's my questions first about the family center. Uh, Fran, I have other projects I wanna ask, but can I get answers to those questions first? Yeah, take them one at a time. Okay. So I'll, I'll have, um, Tom can answer the green and I can address the... Mm -hmm the organization component if you want. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna ask Bill to, to talk about the uh, uh, green issue. When, when we're doing a school project, we are required, it's actually, it's actually uh, required uh, by the state that uh, uh, we build, uh, when we're building a new school, that uh, it be built to, uh, I think it's uh, silver, Lead, lead silver standards, I believe. And uh, so it, that definitely does get taken into account on any project that we're doing. And it certainly was taken into account on the PONUS uh, edition. It's being taken into account on the um, Jefferson School and Cranberry School, uh, Norwalk High School. So all of those projects uh, are, uh, you know, it does uh, get, uh, it's a very important consideration uh, that we're actually required to take into account. In terms of this uh, Family Welcome Center, uh, Bill, I'm not really sure what's in there uh, at this point in terms of uh, green building design. Uh, can you talk to that issue? Uh, we're not uh, fully uh, there, uh, although it's definitely been discussed, but that roof needs a total replacement uh, so for one, that will uh, certainly be a great example for uh, solar panels for the entire roof. Uh, also the energy performance standards, um, uh, which means all of the uh, windows that will be replaced will also um, fall into that category. So there's no doubt while 
issues, there's no doubt that uh, there will certainly be some serious green initiatives uh, incorporated mm -hmm. in the uh, bridge renovation. Uh, actually, while we're talking about, I, I'm sort of going back to the earlier question, but since that, that question was related, one other initiative to certainly be aware of uh, that uh, is that the district has also moved to a propane uh, fueled bus fleet. And that move occurred on uh, July 1st, actually. So our contractor, uh, which we have a new contractor for school buses, uh, and we received a, as part of that contract, an entirely new fleet of school buses was put in service. And uh, so that with that contract, we now have uh, all of our school buses are um, fueled by uh, propane rather than diesel, yeah, or diesel uh, uh, fuel. And uh, as you know, uh, diesel engines uh, emit uh, a lot more, um, uh, uh, you know, pollutants and, and particulate uh, matter uh, compared to propane. So it's a huge uh, advance uh, uh, in terms of uh, the air quality uh, and the impact that our school buses have on air quality in Norwalk, uh, both for all of our residents and for our students. Uh, Tom, I want to compound by saying, oh, maybe one or two years back, uh, this commission approved the replacement of our Border bed box truck, which traverses the city um, and uh, has heavy use uh, for deliveries to the schools. Uh, the truck was uh, beyond its useful life. It was gasoline powered. Uh, this commission approved uh, a replacement of that truck only in propane. Uh, it's, it's actually a hybrid truck. It's propane primary, it also runs on gasoline. We are about to take possession of that truck. And what we have in front of you today is the second truck replacement, the rack body truck, which gets just as much use. That too is being proposed to replace under a propane uh, a dual fuel powered as well. Uh, both trucks are beyond their useful life. This rack body is literally, um, it's been uh, put in the, uh, uh, one of our yards because it's undrivable. So um, there too, we have the green initiative we may have already started in the city uh, for our vehicle replacements. We um, are looking at propane uh, MPS vehicles in lieu of the uh, buses that Tom just mentioned. So I guess in terms of the um, space for the family and community partners, I, I, I would guess Dr. Estrella or Brenda Wilcox-Williams would probably be best set to answer that. So, uh, Mary, can I call you Mary? I can't hear. You're muted. Yes, please do. It's just fine. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so when we thought about this project, we knew that this was an, a community effort. It couldn't be done in isolation by the schools alone. So we have already started having active conversations with Norwalk Acts and other community partners, because in order for us to do this effectively, we're going to need all of our community-based organizations supporting the work. We haven't identified the exact square footage, but we did have conversations about having Norwalk Acts as one of the entities stationed in um, the Welcome Center, because we wanna make sure that we engage create not only our K to 12, but starting as early as Cradle, as, as cradle to, to career and beyond um, to allow us to have kind of a really robust um, program that starts nurturing and informing parents of the resources that are available to them even before they get to fully infiltrate themselves into a system. The, the other piece um, that we're also looking at is having our, our one of our local health clinics or more than one, depending on availability, to provide um, health services at the center as well. Um, so this, this uh, structure will enable our families to have all the services they need in one location. And when services might not be at this site, also have 
personnel there that can guide them through the available services throughout Norwalk that are there to support the, their, the development of their child, but also the family at large, because our focus is in order for our children to be successful, our families need to succeed too. So we wanna make sure that the services are robust in nature. Um, so we are looking forward to having uh, active partnerships in that way. The other thing that we're taking into consideration um, where the gym is, we're, we are hoping to renovate that into a professional learning center that not only will provide um, professional development opportunities for the district at large, but also a convening for all of our local community members to come together and have conversations about partnering and, and the work ahead. So we're seeing this as, as a place where the community can come together to really do what's best for our children. I'm really happy to hear that. And I hope that there will be sufficient dedicated space. There have been some efforts that were done in the past where they tried to do that, but as the uh, business, so at the Norwalk Community Health Center, they tried to build in some space, but as they grew, they ended up having to uh, take over some of the community space. So I do hope that there will be respected spaces because it's absolutely essential for the success of this center as you probably know better than I do. So, uh, so that was my first set of questions. Fran, may I ask another set of questions? Yes, I'm just have to get a cord. So please do Mary. So once we'll, go, we'll pass to every commissioner, okay? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so I wanted to ask um, in terms of the, uh, the technical career center, I wanted to know what the projected enrollment was. And um, you did mention about some of the careers I know, well, that's not so important from a capital budget perspective, but I'm more interested in, uh, in terms of what you're constructing, the size and any special outfitting that you're gonna have to do for different careers. Uh, well, you know, I, I'm not sure that we have it fully um, specked out at this point. I think I, I'm going to ask the superintendent again to jump in. My understanding is we're thinking that perhaps this might be a, a school that would serve about 100 students, I think is, is what I had heard uh, suggested. And, and maybe Ralph uh, Valencisi may also have some insight into into what the uh, what the plan is here and in terms of uh, you know the square footage uh, that that 100 students would require I don't know whether uh, you know we can try to run some calculations for you but uh, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Ralph for the superintendent to see if they can kind of add a little bit yeah, so uh, great, thanks. Uh, Dr. Stray, if it's okay, if I can just jump in on the uh, programming piece. Um, hi, Mary, how you doing? Good, um, thank you. Good, good. So yeah, so um, actually we're starting to gather all of the data for this. Obviously we're looking at a projection of 2025 and on January 29th, I can make sure to send it to Fran or to anybody else. Um, from one to three, we're actually having a workforce development kickoff meeting um, in partnership with NORAC Acts to start looking at, at the different programs and what verticals would actually make sense. Yeah, I signed up for that. Oh, good, perfect. So you'll learn more about that at that, at that point, um, but we are starting to gather data. So those are some of the verticals that we know that are, are in the governor's um, workforce development plan and that are um, actually centered around um, Norwalk. We're also going to be obviously the marine sciences piece is one thing we won't be talking about too much in that first meeting, but that's something that's that's very obvious that will be there as well too. So we're we're really just starting to gather the data right now to know exactly what those verticals will look like. So uh, I guess my only question is I uh, I would just um, I'm wondering I'm a little concerned that when we're thinking about uh, a technical high school that we don't want to make it a place that we're sending kids that are failures or uh, you know, all, all other alternatives. So I hope that we're building enough capacity that all students that see it as an alternative. Uh, so I hope that we're creating that kind of ambiance around it. Um, I know that there's a necessity for these, but that's partly why I'm asking about the, the capacity of how many students. So uh, I'm hoping that it's built into something that's attractive for a wide swath of, of 
students and not just ones that are not doing well on the college track. Um, because I think it can be interesting to a wide swath of students. Um, yeah. So, okay. so Mary, we actually have had a, an experience just even recently when we were talking, uh, this is just recently at Brian McMahon last year, to give you an idea where we brought in a number of students and we started talking to them about the auto industry. And finding out from there, just the, the you know, we probably had about 40 students that showed up to this after school workshop. And what was interesting was to see how many of those students were actually not interested in going to college, but actually interested in going into careers in things like the auto industry and stuff. And they were, they were a wide swath that we were seeing right away. So that's the, that's the type of data that we'll be gathering. Yeah, we're looking at this uh, across the boards because uh, this is just a need for all students. And Ralph, if you, uh, my third area of questions was really around the technology plan. And I didn't know if you were gonna be providing details but um, it would be really helpful to have an update about how many students you've been able to reach. I know that we supported your last plan you did in the spring. I am so glad we made that investment in light of COVID at that time. I don't think we all knew just how bad it was going to be. So I'm so glad we did do that investment, but I'd really like an update because these are not small investments. And if you could give some context of the coverage of going to a one-to-one -one where are we right now on a one-to-one? -one? What's the shortfall? And because these computers have a certain lifespan uh, that's three to five years, what are we talking about down the road for replenishment if we're gonna continue with the strategy? So we, we actually are one-to-one -one now. We've, we've hit every student and we do have a plan moving forward. That's actually what you're seeing in the plan that, that's in front of you. So if you look at it in the breakdown, the lion's share of the money is actually a, our starting our refresh rate because now that we've gone to a K-12, pre-K-12, one-to-one program, we'll be needing to replace machines on an average of about a four-year lifespan. So that means three times in the lifespan of a student while they're with the North Public Schools. You'll see that at the kindergarten level, you'll see that at fifth grade, uh, going into sixth grade, and then you'll see that at ninth grade. Um, so in this coming year, what you're gonna be seeing, there's a, a, an estimate of about 2,500 machines. Um, ab the average that will happen every year for a refresh rate will be anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 computers. And so we do have a, like I said, I don't have it there, but we do have kind of a refresh rate mapped out over time. But the idea would be you come into kindergarten, those machines come in, uh, like in the summer, we clean them up. Um, they, they get continually used for the next four years, but there need, does need to be a refresh three times throughout really the career of a child that actually equates to about four years um, of a lifespan with the uh, computers. So should we expect to see for the capital budget then, um, what should we be expecting to see every year? I'm looking at this current budget where it's got the 331,000 every year, because this is gonna be an ongoing investment. Is that what we should expect to see uh, every year then for refreshing, so, if we're gonna keep with the strategy? So the, the strategy that we put in there was that ideally, sooner or later, and Tom, feel free to jump in with me too, um, the, the computers themselves really are, should they be considered a capital cost or should they be operating? So in order to get this started for the first year, we do need it out of capital. But moving forward, we really do need to look at this as just becoming a regular operating expense. Um, it does increase your operating budget. But is that that's probably the way to do it. And then that's why you're seeing three, the 331 moving out is truly infrastructure. It switches, it's, you know, LCD panels, other things of that sort. So it's changing the model of that. But it does allow then to think of, you know, things in the future as we start really digging into this lease options and other types of opportunities for a refresh rate that's then considered just part of the way that we operate. And, and we need to kind of get that into place. Okay, my last question, Fran, and then I promise I won't be. Uh, my last question then, have we encountered any problems with uh, children having connectivity pro problems? And if so, how is the district addressing connectivity problems? So we, we did, uh, we, we actually, um, we did realize as soon as we went into this, uh, you know, this, this shutdown back in March that we had a number of students that had connectivity problems. Um, to make a long story short, though, we did actually, through, through the work of Dr. Stray and working quickly with the Dalio Family Foundation, um, we've had an initiative that we started earlier this summer 
um, which allowed us to connect a thousand, we, we estimated it to be about a thousand families that really need internet access. And we wanted to make it equitable, meaning that we didn't want to just give them hotspots. We wanted to give them either strong public Wi-Fi or actually broadband access to their computers. Because obviously the, the computers themselves without access really were, were pretty much not useful for, for students. Um, with that though, to make a, a you know, just, just to kind of sum it up real quick, um, we've connected over 500 families with either public Wi-Fi access or with um, internet access broadband into their homes through this grant program with the uh, Dalio Family Foundation. And they're paying for that through June of 2021. Um, so it's been, been really, really effective. I think you've probably heard about the second part of this program that we've done with the city, where the, we have family navigators at Le Mans, or Port Le Mans, and we're working in partnership with them so that obviously if, if families need internet access, they probably have food access issues. They probably have social emotional issues. So that list is actually one of the ways that the community navigators that Le Mans working with are able to get out and offer other services as well. So we're really looking at a holistic approach of how to support families in general. Thanks so much. And Fran, thank you for your patience for letting me ask all those questions. Uh, uh, Ralph knows these questions are near and dear to my heart having worked uh, many years ago in the school system. Definitely. Thanks. Very good, Mary. All right. Who wants to go next? Commissioners, this questions? Is Tam Tamara Shockley. Go ahead. Okay. I have two questions. One, the Briggs Family Welcome Center. I want to know why, for me, there's a question of why there's a need for a welcome center as opposed to using the money to put in existing resources. I'm looking at the type of services that the Welcome Center will provide. And one of the questions that I, one of the issues I don't see being addressed is that Norwalk is composed of different student communities. And I see here that the focus appears to be on multi-language learning and bilingual social workers, special education. But in Norwalk, there needs to be a need to address students, not only who have multi-language, issues, but students who are high academic achievers, those issues aren't addressed, as well as students who may need remedial work. And I don't see that being addressed in the Welcome Center. And my question is also, you're looking at a very old building. Did you look at the possibility of tearing this building down and just building a one floor smaller Welcome Center? Um, can I get that address, Fran, before I go on to the career? No, take, yeah, Tara, take, take it one question at a time, just like okay. Mary did, okay? Okay. So, so I think in terms of the Briggs Welcome Center is not intended to just focus on special education and multilingual learners. The reason why it's emphasized that these, um, community of learners will be serviced is because currently the way that they're being serviced is very dispersed throughout the system, unlike um, other students within the organization. The focus is not necessarily to provide um, intervention services or enrichment services in terms of academics, but really um, focused around an entry point of access for all families within um, the district at large. I think that the, the emphasis on these two particular um, student populations is one because, for instance, when you have a child with, that comes into the district with specialized learning needs, they have to go into different, different locations throughout the district to acquire the services that they need. And having a welcome center where all the services are in one site and one location allows a child when they come in and, and are registered to the, to the school system to have access to all of the testing and, and resources that they need so that they can easily transition into the school building. Similarly with multilingual learners, when multilingual learners come into, the, into our system, they require um, multiple additional steps that other, other um, student groups might not 
And usually they have to go to multiple sites and locations either to get testing, to get language assessments and to complete the, the registration process. So having a welcome center allows us in one location to offer all of these services, regardless of whether the, the child is gifted and talented um, in a general education setting, needing special, a specialized service, needing language services, all of, all of these different components that might exist, that are currently existing in different areas of the district and our families need to, to navigate the complexity of this, of these different elements, having the Welcome Center will allow them to have an, one site where they can get all the services they need. Even uh, simple things as getting a physical, especially with families that might not have the resources to go maybe to private, um, private health care will have the ability to get the physicals, the shots, and all of the additional social services that they might need to support their child, their child's success. So it's not intended for a particular population of students, it's intended to provide all students an opportunity to have a seamless process and entry into our system, while also providing all families with services that go beyond just the basic needs of what the, the school system can offer by having partnerships like I articulated earlier to Mary um, with our different school-based, uh, not school-based, but community-based organizations that beyond the school day can also offer additional interventions and resources to our families. And I don't know, Tom, if you want to add anything or the rest of the team. Could someone respond to whether you considered tearing down the old brick school and building a smaller, uh, building a smaller welcome center? So in that perspective, um, Briggs is, it's, is a small building and the space that is currently there suits the need that we have, Getting it, making anything smaller would not allow us to encompass bringing in um, community-based organizations, health organizations, as well as the services that we are going to be combining at the center. Um, so we really need the current um, size and infrastructure that we currently have. It would be an added cost to tear down and rebuild the building when we, could, we have the possibility of rehabilitating um, the building that's currently there. Are you looking at possibly renting out different rooms in order to bring in additional resources to the community? We have spoken about uh, the possibility. I, one of the things that we've learned is some of our health providers are having a hard time um, with some of the, the, the rental costs that they have to, um, the costs that they have to incur. So we were considering providing it at, at a reasonable cost space for them in exchange to services that they can offer our families and children. Are you going to have any recreational facilities there since it is a welcome facility for families? The recreational services will be um, in partnership with our community-based organizations. I'm talking about physical recreation facilities there. Basketball court. If you're talking basketball courts, places where the kids can come in and relax and play, or the, is the site is not intended to have um, students per se receiving services there. It's more of an opportunity for our families to uh, first re one register their their children and acquire social services that are not necessarily tied to having students. Um, utilizing the, the facility as a learning center, which I think is what you are referring mm -hmm. to. Can some of these services be offered through website where the family can just go and register online? There could be elements of that, but a lot of our fa families would want to have a space where they can engage and have like one-on-one -on -one interactions with the people within the district. Um, a lot of times uh, we have families that don't have the accessibility um, or understanding of the complexity of our system and need to have individuals that, in, that they can engage with and support them through the process. But so- Could that be also offered at the school sites? Because this is not around, this is not located around any major school building. 
could you not also offer that at the school site instead of building a $7 million building? We currently have certain registrations that are being done at the school site and it's created a lot of confusion for our families because the registration for certain populations of students can only go so far within the school building. And then they have to engage um, at, at, at a central site to acquire the additional testing and, um, and resources that they, that they need if a child has specialized um, instructional needs. So currently we can't do that. Um, having the Welcome Center will one also reduce costs around personnel because we have one location that can offer an, an array of services for all of our schools. The site is ideally located also because not only is there parking availability, but there's also public transportation right in front of the building, which is um, crucial for many of our families that don't have private transportation means. Uh, Friend, I'd like to go on and ask questions about the career in technical high school. Ask your questions, okay? okay thank you. What, and I, I have serious concern about the career in technical high school. Historically, vocational career in technical high schools are where you would put your minority students if you feel they are not going along the right track. And I see here that they that one of the questions was, what do we do with our students from Briggs? Briggs was a school with Chad at risk students. This particular endeavor, my concern is that if Norwalk has this option of a vocational school, that when a child is in sixth or seventh grade and is having difficulties, that's 12 and 13 years old, when a large number of children have difficulties, a teacher or administrator will say, well, we're gonna put you in vocational school. It has been my experience that students, predominantly white students would go on a college track and predominantly minority students would go on the vocational track. Although it could have been a situation where later on in their academic career, they could have been retracked into an academic track. My concern here, number one, is that this is not going to be a dumping ground for minority students. I looked at uh, one of the documents that was sent to us originally, and it said that preferably South Norwalk. That concerned me because South Norwalk is a minority community. And here you would have a vocational school located in a minority community where the student's perception is that all I can do and achieve in life is to go to a vocational school because that's down the street. I do strongly disagree putting a vocational school in uh, South Norwalk. I would like to see whether students are, in, how many students are actually interested. And this is my concern as well, that if this school and primarily the location, if this school is located outside of South Norwalk and perhaps near uh, Norwalk uh, Community College, and somehow attached near that campus, then that student who will go, who wants to go and learn a skill or a trade can also see they have other options after they graduate from the vocational school to go on to college because that college is nearby as opposed to being tracked and sequestered in their own community. So I think you need to look at the perception of the student. And I think you need to look at the needs of the student, especially when you start tracking students at sixth and seventh grade to go to vocational school from ninth and 10th and 11th, 12th grade. Many students can turn around in 10th grade and go academically to college. But if you got them in a vocational school, their careers are tracked for the rest of their life. So I think that's something you need to look at. I don't want this to be a dumping ground for minority students. And that is what vocational, and historically, that is what vocational schools are. Okay. So what's the question? The question is, what is your, what is your solution to prevent that this school will not be a dumping ground for minority students and to, and 
to encourage students, not only that this is just an option, but you have other options for careers. So what is your solution to help the students? So I first have to preface as, preface as a woman of color and, sub, and someone who clearly understands how the system can undermine um, what a person of color can and cannot do. I would never create a situation that would be a dumping ground for, for children of color. I think the BRICS perception um, was designed or created because there were a lot of things that we learned from that experience that I think we could do a lot better moving forward. When I think of Korean technical education, I think about a very rigorous process because students are not only engaging in what they're required to do for their coursework in middle school or high school, and then also learning a, a skill or a trade. It is, it, my, my thinking about and, and philosophy around this is not that it becomes a mm -hmm. dumb because it, it would require students to engage in a very rigorous instructional model that places them in a situation where they are acquiring the knowledge and skills that they need to have to have a high school diploma, but at the same time, learning a, a skill or career pathway that will allow them to have a job after high school with the option that if they choose to, they have the, the access to go to college. We wouldn't, my goal is not to create a program that will limit students to have access to that. Why South Norwalk? One of the reasons why we considered South Norwalk is because when you look at student population density, the densest um, place it, right now where we have students and we'll have a presentation in the next few weeks around the current um, population, student population trends in Norwalk currently exists in South Norwalk. And as many of you know, historically, we ha there haven't been schools placed or built in the South Norwalk area. And that's one of the things that we're trying to change. Um, many of you are familiar with the concept of District 99, which is one of the things that we're trying, that we're trying to currently address because every child in every neighborhood deserves to have a, a, a community school. And that's something that um, hasn't been in existence that we have to fix and do better. So in thinking about the Korean Technical School in South Norwalk, it wasn't in the mindset of single creating a single track for black and brown children. As a mother of, a, of, black, of a, a black and brown children myself, I would never create that scenario for children. And, and it's not what I'm in the business of doing as an educator. I think that th this program is intended to create a very, a very rigorous pathway that provides our students with options to career paths of interest, one, and two, that gives them a broader option to have career choices of going to college and beyond, but at the same time, have the option to have a pathway after high school if they choose to. Um, but it's, it, it's not an easy pathway and it's not intended to place our black and brown children in, in a track that is different from, from their white counterparts. In, in the contrary, it's gonna, it, the way that we're thinking about the design of this work mm -hmm. is very rigorous because students are going to be required to fulfill high school requirements while they are developing a career path that will lead to job opportunities after high school. Um, so I think um, Tamara, if, if, if this work moves forward, I would love to have you as part of, uh, part of the tax force conversations around the design of this program, because I, I think your questions bring a lot of insight to some of the concerns that the community will probably have as we think through this work. I hope I answered your question. You did. I would like for the board to, do, to consider placing the school near Norwalk Community College to get the school out of the community and so that students can see there are options beyond just the high school vocational track. And I do understand that, and I, if I remember correctly, they would take a basic courses in the English and math in the morning and then they would go on to their vocational track. The majority of them did not go to college. So I want this to be carefully monitored in terms of, and also if it is near Norwalk Community College and if it offers technical skills, there may be other communities that may want to send their children at a location 
near Norwalk Community College as opposed to South Norwalk. So there are different options and opportunities that you can have from the perception of the student to make sure that the student understands, I want to do this as a vocation. I don't want to go to college, but I don't want that to be decided by a sixth grade or seventh grade teacher. Can I add something really quickly? Uh, Ms. Shockley, one of the things that I'm most excited about that is outside of the realm of the Board of Education is actually a state initiative. Uh, last year, the General Assembly passed a law statute uh, making community college free for every high school graduate in the state of Connecticut. And I think your idea of making sure that all, all of our students have the opportunity to um, imagine themselves at, at Norwalk Community College or any college, if, if we can get them there, uh, will, is, is, is spot on. That we need to make sure that we are uh, sparking their passions and their imaginations of what their best self can be and, and their most self-actualized life, right? So I hear you and uh, we will definitely take your comments into account. I'll bring that back to the board and we'll, we'll definitely consider that. Thank you so much for your uh, really testimony and your passion. I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Uh, I do, good evening. I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Barbara um, and uh, Brenda and also Alexandra. Um, I, I do my research on you guys, I really do. Um, and I asked questions. When Alexandra came aboard, I was excited because she has experience in inner cities, populations. She has the family that uh, she's supportive of and she wants to point them in the right direction. So the decision that you guys make and your thinking tank is always spot on. And I, I really appreciate that because I, I have three kids of my own here. I'm not going to too many questions. I think we need to just even this, all, even this whole thing out. Um, I went to vocational school for the first year and realized that it wasn't for me. I was pushed to go into vocational school in Stanford called JM Wright Tech, uh, me and my four older brothers. And we all realized after the first year, it wasn't for us. Besides that, kids do need to have hands-on uh, teaching and skills. Um, to echo uh, Bill's thoughts about the auto industry, um, I heard a couple of major developers uh, in East Norwalk is looking to rent out their space to some um, uh, auto manufacturing servicing uh, uh, companies that could uh, use uh, McMahon as a feeder program, which makes sense. You know, kids need to have different styles of, and approach. What we're faced with is the parent involvement. We're faced with District 99. We're faced with the resources to get these kids to to understand their, their full potential or their possible potential. Um, the question that I have to everyone here is that when we, when we think of these kids, uh, just don't think of just convenience and a dumping facility to put these kids in. Um, let's really put your, your mind, you can't help 100% of the population, but if you get a good stronghold um, of a demographic that we can see and we could track after three, four, five, or six years, we'll be able to see the progress. And then the next phase of people that are in our seats now could take that to the next level. So we need to set it up, the foundation. So when we're out of this position in four or five or six or seven years, that we can see the journey so that Mary doesn't have to come back years later and say, ho, ho, let's, let, you know, let's, let's put the brakes on this. Where are we? Because last time I was being an educator, there's a big gap here. So if we could all just think, instead of our differences, think of what could we lay down as a foundation so that when we're not in these seats right now in five years, we can come and be a fly on the wall and say, yes, we see the progression. It's not about how much money is being spent because on this board for 13 years, I talked about money and what we can afford and what we could afford. Now there's money on the table. 10 years ago, there was no money on the table for Board of Education, Alexandra, before you came here. Trust me, 10 years ago, we would never talk about this stuff. We were talking about um, building blocks somewhere else. It was weird, but with the whole uh, Columbus movement, Bruno Court, I seen the thought. I seen the I seen the foundation that you're talking about, Alexandra, putting the kids closer instead of shipping them away all over parts of Norwalk where they have no breakfast already because their parents are gone to work. They're they're on a bus for 45 minutes. They're tired. They're falling asleep. Then they come all the way back, and now okay. A local school, local education, local touches and feels, great. My main concern, really, because I can go back this all day long, I have to, there are three good schools in Norwalk because of our involvement, 
not because we put it on the teachers to teach them. We as parents teach our kids, but back to the foundation, whenever you go back to your thinking tanks, Barbara, Brenda, Colin, I don't know you, but how you doing anyway? Um, <laughs> I would say put together the foundation so that when you leave this seat in four years, you can come back and say, okay, we probably not, we probably didn't agree to everything, but we put the foundation together so that you can see the progress. Not about the money spent. We want to okay. be able to track our progress in Norwalk because the surrounding towns, Wilton, Westport, Darien, Richfield, New Canaan, look at their education. We're in the middle of all three, six of these boarding towns. And look how people will spend 200 grand more just to buy a house on the outskirts of, of this town just because the kid go to a school knowing mm -hmm. that parents teach their children. So let, the, let's go ahead. Sorry, uh, and pay a 35 mil rate to do it. Yep. Of course. So with that <laughs> being said, let's, let's not make Norwalk a redhead stepchild of us not being on the same page. Let's think progress and foundation so that in five years, we can see that outlet of what we're brainstorming now. So thank you all for the time. Tom Hamilton, as you know, um, you, you, you know, you know the whole city already. You know what we're going through. Put the pieces together, Tom, that makes it work, okay? That's all. That's so great, Steve. And I wanted to just quickly circle back to one thing you brought up, um, Ms. Shockley, which was uh, the question of interventions and gifted education. So one of the reasons that the board very intentionally selected Dr. Estrella was because of her track record in her previous district in District 4 in East, East Harlem. She, so do you remember a couple of years back uh, when the board was very pleased with a 1.2 or 2% close in the gap, uh, the achievement gap? Dr. Estrella achieved a 33% gap closure in her district in, was it five years or three years, Alex? <laughs> yeah, I can never remember. I got to get that memorized. But um, these kinds of actions where we're looking at the whole family is how we can turn the ship. So when I first was elected, I attended a really great presentation by Norwalk Acts that broke out our um, test scores by demographics. And I was shocked to see where our African-American boys were on that graphic and uh, immediately started asking people, why is this happening? What do we do? And the building leaders who had the highest concentration of, of that population that we were not serving to our best ability said, we need to support these families. We need school psychologists. We need social workers. We need access to resources like food banks, clothing, heat assistance. And so for the family center is really about putting everyone at as much of an equal or at least a stable footing as possible so that they can begin to even try to learn and achieve their highest potential. And I think um, your points are so well taken that um, I think the board has been looking at everything this year through an equity lens and trying to figure out where our systems might not have been fair. And, and, and that actually is uh, displayed in this capital request because we took stock of everything we had done in any building and said, we need to do this in every building and we need to not do it by 2030. We need to do it by 2025 or 2026 because all of our students deserve to have clean floors, safe habitats, clean bathrooms that work, sinks where they can wash their hands, lockers that close and, and open, <laughs> you know, the basics. And so I just wanted to really say, I hear you. And as a board, we have focused on the operational side. And if you want, we can talk about it. Um, our gifted program, we have redesigned and we changed the entry um, system um, so that it is more equitable and we are seeing a great rise in, de in a demographic shift in that program and creating access for more students. And the gifted program touches all students in the building K-8 because we're using a school-wide enrichment model to let children pursue their passions. On the side of um, interventions, that's one of the reasons we chose Dr. Estrella because she is so skilled 
at leading a, a very difficult ecosystem to turn the ship. And um, she has already begun to evaluate our SRBI process and our, our tiered interventions. And in our operating budget, which is not your concern necessarily, but you live here just like us, and so it is, um, we have asked for equitable resources for literacy and math uh, specialists who are trained and will be uh, centrally uh, deployed and managed through the curriculum department so that every school has that resource, not a school who's able to raise the money some other way, but every school. So we're really working at the equity piece and, and I'd love to talk more about it when everybody's not forced to listen to me babble, but thanks. <laughs> I just have one comment to that. And I'm looking at this Welcome Center. There needs to be an outreach to the community as in someone walking door to door. It doesn't matter what services you provide if the people don't know about it. They may have a child that has some problems, but if they don't know that this resource center exists and also having the time to get there. So there may need to be some services that may have to go door to door and offer to the child itself. Otherwise, this is just gonna be an empty building. Can I speak on that? So I'm Diana Carpio, Vice Chair of the Board of Education. And Tamara, I absolutely agree with you. And that is part of what I've been working on with the Board of Ed and the lots of discussion. Um, if you see my Facebook page, I am always constantly on the pavement, meeting families, going door to door, every different um, neighborhoods. I grew up in South Norwalk and you're right. And the reason I ran for the Board of Ed is because through the many years of volunteering at schools, there were so many families that had no idea what resources they had. They didn't know where to go. They didn't, e they didn't even know what questions they were supposed to ask. So I was the person that everybody knew that would ask me, you know, my child can't read, what do I do? I think my child is, has, is diabetic. I think my child just broke an arm. There were so many different questions that the parents had no idea what to do. And um, Barbara and Dr. Estrella, they will tell you that I have always talked about that. And that's a big part of who I am and what I want to push the equity and equal resources and getting the information out. When I started with the Board of Ed, I mean, we didn't even have meetings in other languages translated. And look at us now, I mean, the translations out there, I keep talking to families and letting them know that they can um, log into our meetings and listen, because that's another thing, if they don't know that it's there, they're not gonna be signing in to listen. So for me, that's a big deal and we are discussing it and I will make sure that we figure out a way to get families involved and know that those resources are there for them. Even if I have to walk door to door and ring those doorbells. Okay, I have to get us regrouped here. Okay, so um, Tamara, are you, are you done with your questions? I'm done, Fran, thank you. Okay, all right, who's, uh, who's, who's next? Anybody from the planning commission? I have questions. I'm, I'm going last. So who's uh, any? Go ahead. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Um, um, welcome, Dr. Estrella. I haven't had the opportunity to meet you in another meeting. Um, I guess you've been here for a little while now, but you seem new to me. So anyway, welcome. And thank you for um, lending Norwalk your talents. Um, I, a few questions. I'm just the, the Briggs Family Welcome Center, um, if I didn't know better, I would think it was like a clinic for healthcare. Um, I would just suggest maybe you incorporate into the title Norwalk Public School Briggs Family Welcome Center uh, to somehow associate it with the public schools because not everybody knows who the superintendent was. Um, he left many years ago. So I would, that's just a minor inexpensive thing, just a suggestion. Um, and I'd just like to ask, are you in the, um, the Welcome Center, will you be adding a lot of personnel 
or will you be taking the doctor or nurses from other schools and putting them in the welcome center? So I think first with the name, we haven't identified a name yet. Um, we, I think there's, there needs to be community engagement on, in terms of what would be the best name for the center. Um, and because we wanna do things in collaboration, we've kept it to the concept of Family Welcome Center or Briggs Welcome Center, just because that was the old name of the building. Um, I think in terms of personnel, we have a lot of the personnel dispersed throughout the district. And one of the things that we will do is bring them to uh, one site um, to allow services to be uh, synchronous and in, um, in one location. We would be partnering with um, community-based organizations and um, our some of our local health clinics to provide um, uh, some of the healthcare needs that students will, will have when they first come in to register in terms of vaccinations and things of that nature. Um, so we would not technically uh, take away from other sites, but um, reorganize the resources we currently have to a succinct place that families will know and have access to without confusion. Okay, so you wouldn't take somebody from say the health department to um, administer vaccinations, you would do them yourself under the school umbrella? It would be under the school umbrella, but with the support of a community-based organization. Okay, not the Board of Health, okay. Not um, unless they are willing, they're, they're, they're partners that want to engage in the process, it doesn't have to necessarily be them. Okay, thank you. Um, and then this question maybe is a little bit more focused towards, um, Tom, because I've been on the board for a few years and you know we had the big master plan um, improving all of the buildings over a number of years. We had some bumps in the road. Now we have a new Norwalk High School. I don't see any mention of that on here and I know it's a big nut. And then um, the career and technical high school, that's a very big nut that um, I don't believe was in that original 10 year plan that we started with. Mm, I can't remember if it was five or six years ago, Tom. So how do you see those you know, really big numbers fitting in here? Well, um, Norwalk High School actually has already been approved or at least the local share of Norwalk High School has been approved. That was done as a special appropriation Oh uh, boy, I'm trying to remember now when it was. I think it was last uh, spring, perhaps. Uh, it may have even been before the pandemic um, that uh, that the uh, city did uh, approve an appropriation, actually of fifty million dollars um, as the local share. Now the city will have to ultimately approve an appropriation of the state share of the project as well. Uh, the state share was finalized in December, I believe. And uh, the state has uh, pegged this Norwalk High School project at a $189 million project in total. Um, and so actually, and our expectation is that it's, um, the, the legislation provides that uh, there would be a 20% local share and 80% would be covered by the state uh, so actually the 50 million that was appropriated was based on an earlier iteration of the project when the project had been uh, costed out at I believe it was $216 million. And uh, so there may actually be uh, a, a bit of local savings since the project overall size of the Norwalk High School project has been scaled back by the state down to 189 million. So the local share of that project uh, translates at 20% to about $38 million. So there may actually technically be more money, local money already appropriated for Norwalk High School than, than our 20% would represent. So be that, that's a long explanation, but uh, essentially Norwalk High School, the local share of Norwalk High School has already been appropriated. Um, the other major elements of the facilities plan that you referenced have also been appropriated. Uh, 
Uh, but I would add that the district is updating our facilities master plan. We actually have consultants who are now working with the district. Uh, the superintendent also is updating the strategic operating plan. Um, and uh, as part of the update to the strategic operating plan, we're refreshing and updating the facilities master plan for the next uh, 10, 10 year uh, period. Uh, so there may be some new recommendations that ultimately come out of that process, but they're just, you know, that not everything falls exactly in the timing as you might like. Uh, and, and that uh, project is really you know, just uh, barely started. Well, it's, it's underway, but it's uh, not expected to be complete until April. <clears throat> so, um, so again, we weren't able to incorporate anything, you know, additional into the five-year request uh, that may come out of that facilities master plan, but it certainly is something that, uh, you know, we're looking at all of the facilities and figuring out what are the next things that need to be done uh, to our facilities. But in the meantime, we know that the bathrooms are atrocious. We know that fuel tanks need to be replaced. We know that the buildings that don't have air conditioning need air conditioning. So we put all of those items in the, in the request. Can I just make an addition here? So um, Tammy, I, I recall that we had, you know, the priority one through four in each building that was recommended in the feasibility study that was done 2015, 2016, which I just recently reviewed as part of the board's, um, the board's discussions of what's left to do from the previous uh, compromise plan, capital plan. And I, I think it's important to note that hidden inside those priority one to four are aspects of each of these programs that the board has chosen to prioritize and bring before you for your consideration. If you would like us to send a follow-up document so that you can review the previous feasibility study and understand which of these was uh, recommended you know, five and six years ago, we're happy to do that. I think it's important when you look at, a, at something like this and it says new project bathrooms, it's really important for you to know it is not a new project that was part of the priority one through four uh, that we agreed on as part of the capital plan uh, compromise in 2016. And we're just trying to get that done. Anecdotally, the SGC chair at West Rock School told me that um, she has, uh, I think it's sixth grader and eighth grader, um, and she attended West Rocks herself and the bathrooms are exactly as they were when she graduated 30 years ago. So this is an egregious need and we would not, we, knowing what a difficult time we are all in in this economy, we would not have asked if it were not an urgent need. Thank you, I, I'm, I'm sure all the bathrooms could use help. <laughs> they get a lot of use on that, thank you. Um, and then this isn't particular to this budget, but I'm, since we get, very little opportunity to speak with the Board of Ed. I'm just curious what you think of the um, proposal by, I think, believe Senator Duff and Haskell and a few others where we might be moving students in and or around Norwalk, Danbury from smaller towns to larger towns, larger towns to smaller towns. I'm just curious how you think that might impact the Norwalk Public Schools. Alex, do you want to take this or should I? <laughs> Um, you go ahead, Barbara, and then I can interject. Yeah, well, this is we're, we're going off the rails a little bit here, so uh, we have a hard stop at nine o'clock. So, what does okay, get, I'll try and keep it super brief. Hold Basically, on, hold on. What doesn't get done tonight, if we don't get done, you're gonna have to come back tomorrow night, so keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, the Norwalk has declared itself a district of choice, and this would be an additional choice available to our students. We know that we have had um, unprecedented enrollment growth and that that may affect our capacity and our ability to keep up with the number of seats that we need to provide. This could provide us um, a bit of a relief valve on our operating and capital side because um, it's a K-12 program where once the student is entered into the program, they're accepted into that other district until they graduate and the funding comes from the state. 
not from the city. So it alleviates some, uh, it alleviates both space constraints and operational constraints for our district, while also assisting our neighboring districts with their operating budgets and helping them uh, maybe meet some other goals that they're trying to achieve as well. Um, so I hope that helps answer the question. Tammy, are you done? Oh, are you still yes, I, I just threw it out to the, to the floor. Thank you, Barbara. Did you wanna add anything, uh, Superintendent, or, or we can okay, or move on? We can move on. Okay. All right, any uh, other planning commission member who's, uh, who's next, who hasn't spoken, who's got questions? Brand? Go ahead. I wanna thank ev the, uh, everybody for this conversation all night. It's been uh, passionate and I've learned a lot. So the questions were great. Tamara, your question sparked a really good conversation. I think we all think about those things all the time. So. Uh, the answers were very good. And uh, so I, anyway, I just want to thank everybody for that. It was, this has been a really powerful evening. So I want to bring it down a notch. I just want to talk about parents dropping off their kids. And I want to keep it short. I don't want to have a long conversation about this, but I have a pet peeve because I want to be that guy. I'm 60 years old. I took a bus to school. It was rare to see anybody drop off their kids. It was like, very unusual actually to see a car drop off a, a child and of course everything's shifted we all know that so it's it could be 50 percent of kids uh have to get taken to school by their parents and picked up that adds conflicts traffic conflicts danger it adds pollution it adds cost to all of us because we're now doubling up you know as a taxpayer i don't have kids but i am paying for school buses you know, how many, whatever that budget is, it's huge. And I'm paying a million and a half dollars to put in a driveway to accommodate the parents who don't want their kids to take a school bus for whatever reason. I'm sure some of them are quite valid, but is there any effort to rein this in? Where does it stop? I mean, at some point, are we gonna have a fully mobile? And, and I also worry about equity. I mean, it seems like it's almost like there's segregated transportation, we've got the poorer kids taking a bus and we've got the parents who have the two cars and can afford it. And they have got, you know, parents who have jobs that are flexible taking their kids to school. So we've got a, you know, this is a big problem, I'm sure. And I don't wanna spend much time on this, but I just wanna know, is there any effort to like stop this and go yeah. and say, <laughs> like educate parents and, or give them an incentive or give them a, I don't know, there's gotta be some way to stop the madness because I drive by the schools and they park on lawns, the parents drive in people's driveways. I mean, it's just like, mad. it's literally madness. And uh, and so, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm here seeing, I know why we need this thing at Silvermine. I'm aware of it. I went down there and looked last year when this came up and I understand the conflicts and I sympathize with everybody, but would this even be necessary if, most of those kids took the school bus. I'll stop. So Mike, I, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I think all the things that you are articulating are really valid points and things that we definitely have to take into a, a, account. I think it, it has a lot to do with reacculturating people to a different style. But even despite the pieces of like the uh, personal vehicle usage of the driver and those factors, if we took that out of the equation, the way that the driveway is structured right now is a safety issue for the buses. Um, so a lot of the challenges that we currently have um, at Silvermine have more to do with the buses and the amount of easement and access in and out that they have with the current um, with the current structure that 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 exists, so we we need to have this um, driveway re redesign mainly because it is a safety issue when buses are coming in and out. Um, but I think that all the other factors that you're mentioning are valid for environmental purposes and other factors as well. In, in the context of of the work right now and what's most critical is the fact that 
the buses are don't don't have enough space to to really facilitate a safe transition in and out of the of the building. Um, one of the unique things about Silvermine that it's one of our, um, our only dual language um, magnet programs. So we have a lot of buses coming in and out because students are being are coming from all different parts of the district. And as a result of that, that adds a, a second layer of complexity because you have more buses than the typical number of buses that other um, buildings have as a result of providing the option for students across the district to have access to such an amazing program. Um, so having this driveway becomes crucial for, for the safety of children, mainly because of our buses. I don't know can if that- I, Thank you. It's a, it's a, can, I, can I just add a, to that? Because you and I've had this dialogue for about three years now about uh, walkability for kids in Norwalk and, and the wellness issues that are attached to that. So this year I've actually become co-chair of the pedestrian committee of the bike walk uh, commission. And we did a survey in uh, fall of 2019 uh, to solicit um, areas in which, of the city in which uh, parents would like to have their children walk to school but are prevented by uh, lack of sidewalk, lack of crosswalk, speeding, what, what have you. And uh, the pedestrian committee is in the process of communicating those needs. And I would strongly urge the, um, strongly urge the planning commission to consider recommending a higher amount for safe routes to school and working with the state to secure money, more money uh, through their safe routes to school grant program because the amount of work that is needed in order to make sure that all of our schools are walkable for the children who are within the walk radius by state statute is, is pretty um, huge. And we, you know, you talked about the footpath choice in the 70s, Mike, we've had this discussion. Um, frankly, I think that was the wrong decision for Norwalk to have made. It was sort of penny wise, pound foolish. And really we should be upgrading our infrastructure in a lot of these neighborhoods to uh, ensure that families can make a better, healthier choice to walk or bike to school instead of driving. So I appreciate your bringing that up. Thank you. And just to be clear, the uh, that footpath program, you know, that started in the 70s uh, by Patsy Brescia and uh, the various people who were in charge back then, that predated ADA and there was a whole sensibility was different back then, of course, you know, so the, the all that has changed since then but I would include cycling uh, as well. I mean, bicycling to school is certainly an option if there were safe bike lanes uh, around the school. So uh, thank you, uh, that's good. I just, you know, I just don't get the parent thing of for no other reason, they just want the, we all know, a lot of it is just parents not wanting their kids to get on a bus for whatever reason. And that has to change at some point because this is just seems to be getting worse every year. Literally parents are driving and parking on people's front lawns in order to wait for their kids. Uh, it's a real, it's a real problem, serious problem. Okay, thank you. Very good. John Lesko, I haven't heard from you. Do you need to, any questions from you? I do, Fran, thank you. I was just gonna chime in. Uh, I do have a question on the uh, Briggs Family Center. Um, from what I recall, that old high school had several buildings on it. It doesn't have a lot of parking. What are the plans for the other buildings that may not be useful? Are they going to be renovated? Are they going to be knocked down? Is it going to be more parking available? Uh, because it sounds like this is going to be uh, a major attraction for you know people to be coming in, bringing the kids, um, obviously registering and um, being welcomed into our community. What exactly is left of that campus? What is going to be uh, salvaged? What's going to be discarded? So currently the um, back, uh, the, Brig the Briggs complex is in like two separate buildings. Um, the building towards the back is already in operation and um, serving uh, some of our special education programs and um, assessments. So 
that will directly be linked to the work that we'll be doing in the main building. The, the building that we're talking about is the um, building in the front, um, which is the one that is in this repair that we would need to renovate. There is a basketball court in front of the building that will not be utilized because we will have uh, recreational activities in that building that we are um, hoping we can convert into additional parking spaces plus the parking spaces that are on the left side of the building that currently is underutilized because we don't have that many um, people in the building, um, in, the, in the back building uh, right now. All right, so none of the other building will stay and you feel if there's sufficient parking for the number of people that are gonna be attracted to this uh, this new building, this renovated building? I mean, parking is, uh, to be honest, is gonna be tight. Um, and that's why we're looking to convert the basketball court into additional parking for um, the families that will be coming in and out. We also will have a lot of families that will be coming in public transportation. That's why we found the site to be ideal because there's a bus stop right in front. So um, it, there's gonna be a variation of people with private, uh, transportation and those that will be using public uh, access. Thank you. That's it for you, John? Yes, thank you, Frank. Oh. Okay, I have a bunch of questions, but before I go, uh, anybody on the commission that has anything that needs to be clarified or you have an additional question that you thought of or anything else from the commissioners? Well. I'd like to make a yes, statement. Yes, I do. I do. Go ahead. Um, to piggyback Mike Mushak, he did, did uh, lay um, a very important um, concern about the transportation with buses and so forth. Um, there is a there is an expense per year. Um, there is a lot of traffic with the kids. Myself, I bring three kids to three different schools in my car, my wife's car, um, and there's reasons for that. And it's good. It will be good to have a, I know there's always a plan or a study or something that spend more money on, but uh, realistically with the redistricting process or thought process, look at the buses and how we can utilize them more, more, more fully. Um, I think it's very essential. It would avoid a lot of the, the, the traffic for parents going to work. Uh, we start seven in the morning for all three kids uh, prior to COVID and we finish up, you know, at, 8.45, you know, 8.50 a.m. before we even get to work, um, heading southbound or northbound. So um, the traffic and the transportation is very, very important. Uh, it's not as important as education, but it plays a key part because it could affect and it will affect a child's education. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned, can I, can I just respond to that? Um, because one of the things that uh, we've been in conversation about is, look, is looking at conducting a study of our transportation structure right now in the district to create more efficiency around routes, um, especially because one of the things we've been talking about around magnet programming is making sure that students um, across the district have the option. Um, right now, the way we're structured in some cases, students only have access to pro programs in certain schools if, if parents provide private transportation. So, and, and, it, and it's also associated with costs. So one of the things that we will be looking at is the possibility of conducting a study of our current transportation um, routes and looking at ways in which we could be more efficient, but at the same provide, increase the services that we're um, providing our families across the district. Thank you. Uh, John Lesko, were you saying something else before? Thank you. Yeah. I'm just coming back on. Sorry. I'm here. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to um, make just a short statement to all of the commissioners, although I certainly understand everybody has strong opinions on different matters with each of the departments. Um, you know, this is the uh, budget meeting and, you know, the time to make recommendations for different departments uh, to look into um, different venues might better be served going to their meetings, making their recommendations before we get everything to budget. 
we only have a limited time to get through this. And I think um, that some of uh, the things that we've talked about really got off track and uh, we need to get back on track to complete our task. That's all, thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Okay, before I go, anybody else? This is the last call. Okay, I don't hear any, I don't hear anybody. You're good, Fran, go. Okay, all right, so a few things. Um, air conditioning. Those of you who have been on this commission, I've been banging my head against the wall for 10 years and here we are, we have air conditioning. So it's um, Tom Hamilton, you there? Um, I am. Okay, so you've uh, you you heard uh, you heard me in previous years, right? We we've, we've taught every single year air conditioning came up. So I said it only took ten years um, in progress. So I'm glad to see that um, it's number four, and we're almost there with uh, you know almost all the schools, and um, so I'm I'm happy where it is. Okay, won't bang, won't. Uh, uh, go on on air conditioning if the path continues, okay? You're happy um, and we're happy. <laughs> uh, well, a few things. Uh, it concerns me that we have the asbestos abatement program as number five and bathroom renovations as number six. Now, you know, we've heard all these things about how bad the bathrooms are and it's it's pretty bad if students don't want to use the bathroom. So how do we bring this stuff up? I mean, how do we meaning move it up the, the list here? Everything is important, but last year we had the issue with, let me ask this question. Is, is the air quality at Brian McMahon been taken care of? Last year, 200,000 was awarded, was, was uh, put in. So is that a checkoff? Are we good at Brian McMahon with the air quality? Um, Bill Hodell is, is on the line and also uh, Dr. Costanzo is on the line. I, I know we've done um, a lot of work in that area and I believe that um, the funds are available to complete all of the recommendations that had come from um, Con OSHA, as well as Yukon Occupational Health, that both uh, um, did inspections and provided the district with recommendations. So we've done, I guess, probably 85% of it, and the remaining 15% uh, that was 15% uh, of the recommendations, uh, there's funding available to finish up. But I'm going to ask uh, Bill and Dr. Costanzo if they want to add anything to that. So I don't want a long answer. When are we going to finish up? That's okay, the so what we have um, coming up right now is an expenditure of uh, just over $100,000. And that will uh, complete all the recommendations that were made up to this point. So yes, that money that you allocated last year is going to be spent very shortly. Yeah, but what does up to this point mean? Is the air quality good? Is it taken care of? Or you still got, we still got to go on? We still have issues with air quality. Uh, we don't have any current um, complaints about the current air quality. We just have to finish up the items that are on the list. If anything, we have improved the air quality by installing uh, extra high efficiency filters and a HEPA, uh, a portable HEPA uh, ultraviolet uh, filter, one in every classroom. Okay. On, on the bath, on the um, asbestos program and the bathrooms. Tell me why this stuff can be done sooner than five being, you know, ranked five and six. I mean, these are important things, you know, air quality, asbestos, abatement, all that. Why don't we take care of this stuff faster? Well, well <coughs> the... Well, let me, let me jump in and then Bill, I'll let you finish. But uh, the district's intention in, in terms of the priority order here was to put the uh, curriculum uh, 
and instructional uh, requests ahead of the other items because those are services that directly are at the core of what we do for students. So, uh, so the intention there was to say those are high, highest priority because those are devices and those are materials that our students need in order to learn. And that's why we're in business to begin with. The other items, you know, we don't disagree with you. They are all high priorities and they're dealing with safety issues and comfort issues and, um, you know, basic maintenance uh, and, and facility uh, issues. And they're all really equally important, uh, but they have to go in one order or another. So that's, you know, we put them, put them down there as high up the priority list as we can. Uh, but uh, we don't disagree with you that they're all important, that they all need attention. And that's why we've requested funding in every year in the amounts that we've requested. And, and in fact, our board uh, front loaded um, funding on the asbestos abatement program and the bathroom renovations. Um, and I believe those are the two major ones. Oh, and then the silver mine driveway, of course. Um, so, so our board, in fact, um, you know, increased the attention and, and priority assigned to, to those projects. Bill, you wanted to add something? Well, uh, Tom, when, when you guys, I don't know if you said this or, you know, you got duct tape on the floors, you know, and stuff. I understand about the, um, the priority, not really, everything is important, right? Can we do things at the same time? You know, why do we get to the point of duct tape on the floors, foil, toilets that don't flush, um, you know, uh, all the things I wrote down, some of the things, but whatever. So why, why do we have to get to that? I guess that's, that's my question. Well, how do we well if, if I may, um, one thing you have here, you might, you might notice Nathan Hale is um, identified in three or four different categories here. In order to do a bathroom renovation, you can't have a summer program there because there's no toilets, no water use. In order to do an asbestos abatement, you can't have a summer program. You need to remove the asbestos, which is hazardous materials. So we're coupling those jobs together. I also want to add that at Nathan Hill, this asbestos abatement program had started over 10 years ago. They removed all the asbestos floor tile in the hallways and the uh, ceiling tiles, and that was let left dormant this time around we're doing all the classrooms which is harder to do as opposed to the hallways because we have to remove all the contents of the classrooms the books the furniture the bookshelves and whatnot in order to do this so we're coupling the jobs together so we can finish one school and kind of go off to the next well, we've had some downtime in this uh, COVID environment right have we taken advantage of if one can take when the schools there's nobody there? I mean, are we doing? Uh, has any of that played in any of that time? Uh, during our downtime, we have uh, had uh, custodians do a lot of paint, interior painting. We had maintenance staff do exterior repairs. So yes, we have been taking advantage of the downtime. But wow. I just wanted to say, hold on, Tom. I just want to say this year, although it's been COVID, the, the concept of downtime has not existed because in many cases we've had to sanitize and um, engage in, in constant cleaning to maintain the safety and well-being of our, of our kids. I, I think in the contrary, this year the team has been working at an exponential rate to make sure that the health and well-being of our children is, and, and teachers and everyone in the district is well maintained because the facilities are up to par. So, so just, just to be clear, I, I don't think there's been that much time to do some of the um, work that you, you might be envisioning because the, the team has been working seven days a week um, over, around the clock to address a lot of the COVID related challenges that we've had throughout the year. 
No, actually, the answer I was looking for was we've been working on cleaning up COVID. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, and that's what we're doing. <laughs> I'm getting that, but if I can, but if I can I jump in for a sec, Fran, on the repairs, there has never been a better time to bond to do this work because we have such historic interest rates. So, to speak to your point. Uh, if we have 11 schools to do renovations and bathrooms, this is not a bad time to bond it and do it and pay, and pay it out over 30 years at a very low interest rate. Okay, you understand I've been on here a long time and I've, I've heard all the stories and I, I've seen all the um, backup material, if you will. Okay, so thank you. Um, I'm going to say that I, I'm not going to uh, reiterate, but I share concerns on the career and technical high school. Um, you know, what Tamara brought up. And uh, so it, it's a little bit way off, but um, it's a big number and some uh, really uh, deep thoughts got to go into that one about, you know, um, so I, I have the same concerns. I'm not going to go into it again that, that have been expressed already, okay? And now this brings me to the uh, Briggs Family Welcome Center couple of things. I agree with Tammy on the name uh, and you uh, answered about community involvement. Uh, my, my question is, are you going to have Norwalk Public Schools as part of that name? Because right now I see this and it's, if you take out Briggs and uh, Dr. Briggs from many years ago, uh, so Family Welcome Center. And this ties into, uh, you know, we heard at the beginning of our meeting from um, uh, the community services group, right? Which is, uh, uh, this is the uh, Lamont Daniels, uh, uh, you know, group and stuff. So I see overlapping with those services and what you're talking about this being, to me, it doesn't sound like it's just gonna be a school, uh, a, a, you know, you go and register. It sounds like a, a different thing, if you will. And five million, it's seven million coming out of the blue is, is a big number for taxpayers money, right? Let's keep in mind that all this money is taxpayers money. And you have, there's five million alone for abatement and construction. So we couldn't find a building that exists already is up to par. I mean, there's lots of buildings in Norwalk, uh, you know, for sale or lease or, or whatever, that we wouldn't have to spend $5 million to, uh, to, to get it up to par, all right? It's a big expense, $7 million that could be spent on, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not against the idea of, you know, families going to one place and uh, can be a determined if they don't know where to go or what's available, but you talked about, somebody talked about, you know, having them register for school, right? That's I'm assuming. Then looking at all the other uh, programs that are available to families. Uh, but how does that, like I said, you know, we have a department already here, which a community services department. And I don't know exactly what it, um, and from what I remember, it was to tell families what was available to them in, of services that, that, that were available to them. So all these things are um, troublesome. It's a big number when we're looking at budgets, you know, everybody wants, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, we have many requests and a certain amount of dollars to, to, uh, to deal with. So I'll leave it at that right now. And whoever wants to jump in and talk about some of that stuff, uh, go ahead. I mean, first and foremost, um, the, the facility is, is, is one of our buildings that it makes sense to rehabilitate and utilize effectively as, as a resource to the district. When you look at the third floor in City Hall, we are really tight. There's no space there to do much. Um, and it would allow us a location that is um, family friendly, easily accessible. To, to our community. We've looked at other, play, uh, um, other potential places. 
Um, but but everywhere you go, there there the buildings always need work, renovation, restructuring. I think the unfortunate part when you're dealing with um, older construction is that abatement is necessary because of the materials that were utilized to um, build and, and engage in the infrastructure of, of many of our buildings. I, I think even when we look at our schools, we have to engage in the, in the conversation of abatement. The work that, that we would be in, in embarking in the Welcome Center is different from um, Lamont's team because we are, are combining not only the services that, that they might bring to life for our families, but other networks in terms of, uh, of healthcare, as well as other family related support structures that we have in the district, in the community that are not directly associated with um, the city programs. It also will lend an opportunity, like right now, there's nowhere in the district or in the city that there is a space large enough to hold more than 100 people in, in a, a conference or seminar. It will also allow us to have a space where we don't have to rent out other facilities for an exorbitant amount of money when we want to have professional development opportunities and um, seminars for either parents or our personnel throughout the district. So, so it's gonna have a multifaceted use that will en en enable us to combine um, an array of services for our families so that when they, the minute they come in and as they continue to receive serv services within our organization, they don't have to find themselves trying to navigate a really complex system because everything is scattered through, throughout the, the system rather than in one location that they can easily have access to. So it's beyond just information, it's actual access and engagement with local community partners in collaboration with the district to acquire what they need for their children. And I, and I, and I missed the third part of your question. I don't know if you could please repeat it. Maybe I'm not sure which one that was, but um, the, the thing I about been friend, if I go ahead. So uh, I, I just wanted to add uh, two points. One is um, this is a project that because it is a you know city-owned building under the control of the board of education, uh, it would be eligible for a partial reimbursement uh, from the state as a uh, for the construction cost. So um, we estimate it would be eligible for a 16 and a quarter percent reimbursement from the state. So after you factor in that reimbursement, that $7 million cost comes down to about $5.9 million <clears throat> that would be, you know, the, the city would have to bond. And then the city would bond that over, I, as I understand it now, the city is bonding over a 30 year period. So the principal repayment on that uh, over a 30 year period translates into about $196,000 a year plus interest. So I think, you know, if you're doing a financial analysis, if, if there's no other locations that I'm aware of that the city or the board of ed has that we could go into without, you know, putting substantial money into them. So really, if you're looking at alternatives, uh, you know, you'd be looking about, uh, you know, building, constructing something new or potentially leasing space, which, you know, first you'd have to find a space that would be appropriate for this type of use and it would have to be in a location. But, uh, you know, even if you were looking at leasing space, um, you know, I think the financials are going to come out about the same or, or perhaps more expensive to lease property. Uh, for a for a family welcome center, and if we lease property, then there's no, you know, opportunity for any state reimbursement. Obviously, we don't own the property. Plus, the fact that, I, and I think Brenda um, Williams had pointed this out. This is, you know, a building that is in the city's portfolio. It's in a prominent location, and to allow it to just sort of sit there and deteriorate is not really in the best long-term interest of the city. Uh, so I think for all of those reasons, this is a, a good location. Okay, so um, two things. One was uh, about the name.
uh, which I talked about that, you know, what Tammy brought up and it right now it's called Briggs Family Welcome Center. And my question was, are you planning to have associated with, and I heard you about the name being a community thing, but is it gonna be associated with the Norwalk Public Schools? Fran, we would anticipate that down the road it would be branded with Norwalk Public Schools. Right now we were just calling it the Briggs Family Welcome Center since that is what the public is familiar with in terms of its prior use. Um, but it's definitely something as Alex mentioned um, earlier, we would get input on and, and have um, some feedback on and, and uh, name it you know, something that the community is comfortable with. Okay, I'm going to say all due respect to Dr. Briggs. Uh, Briggs, um, I'm sorry to say, it brings back to what the Briggs School was, was to dump kids there who were not performing for whatever reason. So it might have, uh, uh, I know it's the, it might have a negative connotation. So that's just a, yeah, that's yeah. just a comment, okay? We're, we're using it as a placeholder to identify the location so that people wouldn't know what we're talking about. Okay, so uh, follow up, Dr. Australia. You talk about community, other community agencies and all, right? So how is that different from what the other community services are doing? Is that position or that department was created to bring families together to tell them where they needed to go? So how, I don't, I'm, I'm having a hard time separating what this is gonna do versus what that department is gonna do. So obviously we're gonna work in collaboration with, with, those, with those departments that you are articulating. In this case, this is really tying the family when they come in to our schools through the registration process to have access to resources. Normally for them to know that these other agencies exist, they would have to um, either find out from someone or figure out a way to get the resource. In, the Welcome Center, they'll have the opportunity to know that these services exist, especially with NORAC Acts having a, a, a seat or a section in, in the actual Welcome Center and having the level of resources that they have in terms of tying all of the different agencies throughout Norwalk together um, will allow parents to have a, a, a partner in the conversation of knowing what's available throughout the, the city for them to have resources. But it, it, it goes just beyond those services. You have to think about the fact that when a parent, a, a parent or a family is coming in, it's about having them registered, having them have access to the, the language assessments that they need. If a child comes with special, with special services, letting, making them aware of what those services are, any additional testing or revisions that need to be made to acclimate them into um, Connecticut or the Norwalk um, school system and making sure that they get comparable services relative to what was articulated in, uh, in another district or a different state. Um, it also will provide them with um, a, one, a one, one place where they can acquire all these services rather than having to first go to the school, then go to central office, then go to a healthcare provider to complete the registration process, which is multifaceted and multi-step. Um, so unlike what we have now where people, and I've heard this from a lot of parents during my listening and learning conversations that you know, it's great after you're in, but while, while you're navigating the, the enrollment process or getting acclimated into the system, it becomes very confusing because you really don't know where to go and how to access the, the resources and information. So having a centralized registration center will allow families to have all the resources they need in one location and allow them to then also learn how to navigate the other resources that are available to them throughout the organization. And when I say the organization, just going beyond just the district, but also other partners like the community centers that you're talking about as well. Okay, you mentioned there's no room on the third floor at City Hall. Are you moving that whole, uh, are you moving from there to this new center? No, we would need the space to as well. Um, we met some of the individuals that are there will move to the center, 
because they will be providing those services, which will allow us to have adequate space for the individuals that are that will be there. Right now we have people sharing office, like doubling up and tripling up and quadrupling up in spaces because we don't have enough space to provide adequate spacing for all the people that are working in central office. Fred, it would take people like the transportation department who answers questions, you know, year round from families about bus stops. It would take the food service folks and move them there as well so that they could answer questions about billing and payments and, and all that type of stuff. The technology depot would be there as well, the special ed ombudsperson. Um, so there would be people that are now spread out all over central office um, and put them in one central place in addition to the, the incoming registration services as well. And, and one of the things you have to take into consideration as a district now, I think Ralph articulated this, we are a one-to-one -one, um, device district. And as a result of that, parents need to also have access when there are challenges around the device and need a repair, having an, a, a kind of a customer service um, center to support them in the process. That, that's also something that was not part of the original infrastructure, but now has become part of that structure. When you look at the capital, at the capital budget, one of the things that was requested in the past was textbooks. Textbooks have become quite obsolete at this point because now we're utilizing the devices as the tools to kind of house a lot of the resources um, that are text-based, right? So it, it, we're, we're transitioning in terms of like the methodology in which we're doing things, but that also creates a, a different layer of customer service and support to ensure that families and students have what they need under the evolving infrastructure that COVID has pushed us to engage in a more rapid pace, but we were inevitably going to move towards that direction given how technology is evolving in our society. Okay. Uh, I think we've beaten this to death and um, <laughs> it's a, t it's a, it's a, you know, we, we do our, we have one more set of hearings tomorrow night, then we have public hearing, and then we have our evening of deliberations where we have uh, spent excruciating hours debating each line item. So I um, appreciate everybody who's been on the call before I, uh, is anybody from the planning commission? Everybody is good? Okay, hearing nothing. Uh, thank you for your team and all the explanations and um, the conversation, the communication. So it's, it's all been good. So thank you very much. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Thank and it you. was great meeting everyone that I haven't Thanks, met. Friend. We haven't thank met you. you. All. Have, a thank you all. Have a good night. Good night. Thank good night. 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 Good night.